Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Almost a year ago, we started an epic Best Space Navy video series. We looked at a variety of different factions and talked about each Navy's 10 flaws and, and 10 advantages. At the end of each one of those videos, we asked you guys to rate each faction. And now a year later, we have thousands and thousands of votes. And at the end of this video, we'll tally up all those votes and once and for all determine which Space Navy is superior. Enjoy the video. At the Battle of Endor, the Empire assembled a fleet of around 30 Imperial-class Star Destroyers, led by one larger command ship. It's probably one of the largest fleets ever assembled during the Galactic Civil War, until at least the Battle of Jakku. But in reality, it was actually a very small, small portion of the entire Galactic Navy. As a matter of fact, the Galactic Empire had 25,000 Imperial-class Star Destroyers, and that's just one type of ship. So the fleet of Endor defending the second Death Star was far less than even 1% of the entire Imperial fleet. So why couldn't the Empire muster more forces up like the gigantic fleet we see in the end of Mass Effect 3, for instance? For one, Commander Shepard wasn't there to unite the Empire. Also, the Rebel Alliance was pretty small of a threat. I mean, their fleet was mobile and made up of mostly warships that were converted from civilian models. So you don't really need a gigantic fleet, really, to go against them. But the more pressing issue is that the Galactic Empire was simply way too large in territory. The Galactic Empire sprawled across much of the known galaxy and had millions of core systems and millions of more colonies in outer territories. There were, of course, fortress worlds, shipyards, and other strategic systems, but for the most part, one Star Destroyer or maybe even something smaller like a light cruiser could be responsible for multiple planets and systems. So every time you pull off one Star Destroyer from its post, you end up leaving many, many systems vulnerable to attack. For any of you guys who play Strategic 4X games, you probably are quite familiar with this problem. As your military grows, you need new resources, but in order to protect those new resources, you need more military and so on. It's like a cyclical problem that never ends. The size of the galaxy is probably one of the major reasons why the Old Republic had demilitarized and decentralized the Republic Navy and its funding to local systems defense forces. In the beginning, everything was relatively good. The Clone Wars had just ended bringing an era of stability, both politically and economically. The galaxy had started healing itself, guided by the careful policies of Emperor Palpatine. The military-industrial complex and several strategic resources were nationalized by the Empire, and the clone army was disbanded in favor for civilian soldiers. This lowered unemployment and created stability. But then, we'll have Tarkin entered the picture. Hailing from a rough Outer Rim world, Tarkin had a relatively paranoid and dangerous mindset that was completely out of touch with how the rest of the galaxy worked. This was a man who viewed polite society and all the regimenting and regulation as a fragile piece that only worked in periods of economic prosperity. He believed in the the worst parts of human nature, and thought that true order and discipline could only be reinforced with ample punishment. Keep in mind, Tarkin was from a family that sent their young out into the wilderness on a rite of passage where they basically had to survive with basic tools in extremely dangerous situations. And no, I'm not talking about like upstate New York and some black bears. I'm talking about extremely dangerous, like Jurassic Park level fauna dangerous. So the guy had a really crazy and messed up childhood, which led him to create the Tarkin Doctrine. His idea was to make the consequences for treason so high that no one would ever dare step out of line. It's basically the same thing you would do to a wild animal, beat it into submission. The problem was the citizens of the Empire were not rabid animals that could be beat into submission. The Imperial class Star Destroyer and Death Star were important parts of the Tarkin Doctrine. The ISD was an incredible ship covered in a ridiculous amount of firepower, but quite flawed and expensive to maintain. The Death Star was another brainchild of Tarkin, or at least that's what he says. This was an exorbitantly expensive and inefficient use of galactic resources. He would go on to use the Death Star in a totally uncalled for attack on Alderaan. This would increase recruitment for the rebels and also lead to a lot of defection from the Galactic Navy to the Rebel Alliance. Without the Tarkin Doctrine, the Rebellion would have never had the fuel it needed to continue growing. It's probably a lesson that we can apply to a lot of the things going on in our own world. I mean, take a look at Antifa. They can't really survive without white supremacists, and white supremacists can't really survive without Antifa. They, they almost need each other in a really messed up way. There's like this hatred, but there's also this sexual frustration 
You know, they just, they need to do whatever that is. What is that? So anyway, a lot of the vehicles in the Imperial Navy were designed for form over function. The ISD with its 1.6 kilometer length was probably unnecessary for most types of situations it encountered. At the time, most of the Empire's problems came from pirates or smugglers, something that a small frigate or even a corvette could handle. With their tight grip on the shipbuilding industry, it was relatively difficult for non-Imperial Navy organizations to get their hands on anything larger than a civilian freighter. So instead of building 25,000 Imperial-class Star Destroyers, the Navy could have built an even larger number of lighter cruisers and other small vessels. This would have given the Empire the ability to protect more worlds and at the same time, fueled larger fleets with capital ships like ISDs without worrying about any gaps in their local defenses. The ISD and a lot of the larger command ships in the Imperial Navy all had gigantic towers on which the bridge was placed on. It gave the command deck a romantic and inspiring view, but ultimately proved to be a structural weakness in these larger ships. A much more functional approach would have been placing the bridge inside the ship and using cameras and sensors to navigate. The Imperial Navy favored giant turbo laser batteries for most of their ship's offensive power. This fits in with the Tarkin Doctrine's emphasis on entering the enemy and impregnating them with gigantic sticky loads of plasma and fear. Turbo lasers had a massive amount of energy behind them and were cheaper compared to other projectile weapon emplacements. But the problem with these weapons was they were line of sight. So in larger fleet battles, sometimes the lasers could be obstructed. Turbo lasers also lost power the further they traveled. They're also quite easy to dodge given ample time and distance. This meant the majority of capital ship battles in Star Wars happened at ranges where basically no one wins because everyone dies. The Separatist lines during the Clone Wars had used guided missiles and torpedoes to great effect. It was probably a more civilized time and it gave their ships flexible firepower that could be fired without exposing the crew to any immediate danger. But the Empire, with their obsession of penetrating the enemy with long cylindrical turbo lasers, were at a great disadvantage because they decided to go old school, which would make it harder for them to fight longer range modern navies. Although most Star Destroyers were heavily armed when compared to other ships in their class, they also usually lacked a robust point defense system. Some of this was due to the arrogance of Imperial leaders. During the attack on the first Death Star, Will of Tarkin doubted that a few small snub fighters could do any serious damage to the huge space station. Of course he was wrong, as were many Imperial officers who decided to test their ship's defenses against the Rebellion's motley assortment of fighters. No matter how large an Imperial-class Star Destroyer was, a proton torpedo was still a proton torpedo, even if it was fired from a small snub fighters. And proton torpedoes will ruin your day. In most other franchises and in real-life blue water navies here on Earth, larger battleships and carriers that are vulnerable against single pilot craft are usually protected by smaller picket ships ranging anywhere from destroyers to gunboats. While in the Star Wars galaxy, we do occasionally see escort fleets, the majority of Imperial-class Star Destroyers deployed seem to lack any escorts at all. While a Star Destroyer might have problems defending itself from a slash-and-run attack from a squadron of A-wings, a light cruiser or corvette armed with some guided munitions will make those rebel pilots think twice about making that attack run. Then we had the first Death Star, which was basically all by itself and had to rely on its own weapons and placements for protection. Now maybe, again, the Imperial fleet was spread thin. But guys, if you can't afford to protect one of the most expensive space stations ever built with some escort ships, maybe you have no business building that station in the first place. You can see one of the reoccurring themes right now. The Imperial Navy, for all its size and power, really lacked the power projection you would expect from a Navy that big. Now, one of the major problems, of course, was the concentration of resources into a smaller fleet of larger ships. But equally as important was the lack of any good starfighters in the Imperial Navy. Well, at least in the earlier years of the Galactic Civil War. The TIE Fighter in space superiority craft was nimble, fast, but it lacked shields, lacked the hyperdrive, lacked heavy weapons, and even lacked life support. It was just a bare-bones craft, something more suited for planetary defenses or short-range ship defense. And to be fair, that's all the Galactic Empire really needed in the earlier days. But when the Rebel Alliance started fielding advanced X-Wings and A-Wings, the TIE Fighter was woefully outclassed. Which is quite wasteful because TIE Fighter pilots actually were amongst the best trained in the galaxy and went through a lengthy and expensive process to earn the right to become fighter jockeys. This was a huge investment that the Empire committed to, an investment they then shoved into the Starfighter equivalent of a Fiat 500. Look, I know it's a really cute looking car, but you will not survive an American highway in something that small. 
The fact that a TIE fighter lacked hyperdrive severely limited its range and the effective operation range of the ships carrying them. The Rebel snub fighters did have hyperdrives which allowed them to operate without a carrier. This made their fighting force more flexible and able to split into smaller groups and find openings in the enemy's defenses. Now eventually Empire would invest money into more advanced designs. But by the time the TIE Defender and Interceptor were ready for combat, the Rebel Alliance was already firmly rooted and not going anywhere. The Imperial Academy was an extremely cutthroat experience. It's basically like Hogwarts, but everyone's Slytherin. Some might think that the Empire was a meritocracy, and that's probably what the Empire wants you to think, but it was closer to a nightmarish Darwinistic society that was very closely modeled to basically Sith ideology. Officially speaking, Imperial cadets weren't supposed to actively sabotage each other or kill each other, but what was really important was making sure you didn't get caught in the act. So this naturally was an environment where sociopaths and scumbags thrived in. Of course, there were some good officers that succeeded through talent and ability alone, but the overall environment went far beyond good nature competition to something more destructive and ultimately detrimental for the entire Galactic Empire. I mean, what you really want is officers competing to see who can serve the Empire better, but instead you had officers who were competing to see who could serve themselves better. And when those officers left the academy and entered service, that competition only got crazier as the stakes got higher. Officers were constantly looking at opportunities to destroy their enemies and climb in the command chain. This sometimes led to deliberate negligence and even sabotage. This was because the Imperial Officer Pipeline naturally attracted selfish people. And despite what most people think, the Empire is a massive place and the federal government lacks the necessary oversight They really keep order in the entire galaxy. Regional governors and moffs are what really dictated the local imperial culture and working standards. So while some planetary systems were model examples for an imperial world, other systems were the exact opposite with local imperial forces heavily involved in corrupt activities and sometimes even working alongside criminal elements for personal gain. The thing is, no matter how terrifying the Emperor might seem, some systems were really just too far from Coruscant for that to matter. There are many ways to motivate someone. In a capitalist society, it's usually money. I mean, for millennials, it's a little different. We want, you know, a voice to make a difference, to change society, which basically means you're not paying me enough for this stupid mundane job. I want more money. So, so actually, it's also about money. You could also lead through love, be such a magnetic personality that people will be willing to literally move mountains for you. Or in the case of Warhammer 40k, kill the mountain for the Emperor because Warhammer 40k. Then there's the third way, which is motivating by fear. In Darth Vader's case, that fear usually led to death. There's really no problem with trying to discipline your men. But if you make the consequences for failure too high and also the parameters for what failure is way too ambiguous, well, you might just impede the decision-making skills of those under your command. Instead of trying to take the initiative, maybe being a little bit creative when problem-solving, the only thing they're thinking about now is how to avoid dying. Darth Vader was known for carrying out dramatic executions of underlings even while in the middle of an operation. This also usually led to confusion and gaps in the command chain. In general, it was not effective and really lowered morale. Probably one of the biggest advantages that the Galactic Emperor had was its incredibly fast FTL travel. Using a device known as a hyperdrive, ships are able to enter an alternate dimension known as hyperspace and travel across ridiculously long distances in extremely short time. Hello there. The Star Wars Galaxy is about the same size as the Milky Way Galaxy, and based on what we've seen in the movies, it takes about two or three weeks to cross the entire distance, depending on which hyperspace lanes you are using. In comparison, Star Trek Voyager estimated that it would take 70 years to cross the Milky Way Galaxy. So it doesn't really matter how advanced your ship's weapons and armor is if you arrive to the battle years after it's over. Fast hyperdrives allow the Galactic Empire to be extremely mobile and respond rapidly to threats across its systems with relative ease. Although it's not talked about much, the Star Wars Galaxy also has extremely advanced anti-gravity technology. The Empire's mastery of anti-gravity allows it to construct gigantic repulsors, which then allow for gigantic ships like the Imperial-class Star Destroyer to fly in atmosphere, which is a pretty incredible feat. But one of the most interesting gravity technologies that the Empire does have is the gravity well projector. These devices basically created a gravitational footprint that would pull nearby ships out of hyperspace and then prevent nearby ships from going into hyperspace. This is because every starship has a safety feature that pulls ships into real space when they detect a gravity well. 
This prevents a starship flying in hyperspace from crashing into a planetary body, a star, or maybe a fleet of enemy ships. Hyperspace is technically another dimension, but everything in the real world has its own counterpart in the hyperspace world as well. Used strategically by Imperial officers like Thrawn and the Interdictor could dictate when and where a battle was fought. It was also useful in ensnaring more mobile forces into a trap. Instead of pouring ridiculous amounts of resources into the Death Star, the Empire probably could have refitted a significant portion of its cruisers and star destroyers with this technology, making it incredibly difficult for the Rebel Alliance to continue escaping the Empire. This technology was so good it could have single-handedly ended the entire Galactic Civil War before it even really started. The Empire also has tractor beams on their ships, which in the hands of a creative captain can create some very interesting problems for the enemy. Tractor beams were basically focused gravitational energy beams that locked onto an object and reeled it in. Another interesting piece of technology that spawns out of the Empire's grasp of anti-gravity technology was the inertial compensator. This was another device that controlled how gravity worked on a ship. It created a bubble around the ship, decreasing drastically the G's on a pilot and the structure of the ship. This allowed Star Wars fighter pilots to survive maneuvers that would otherwise crush their bodies into a bloody sack. This inertial compensator, along with repulsors, allowed unwieldy craft like TIE fighters and X-Wings to be able to fly in a variety of different atmospheres, despite the fact that these ships have the aerodynamic profiles of a flying brick. More old school or perhaps daredevil pilots like Han Solo routinely dialed the inertial compensator down a few points so that they could have a better feel for how the ship is performing. This type of technology also allowed Star Wars ships to have gravity inside without any kind of rotating structure. While some of the space forces that we'll be talking about rely on kinetic energy weapons and also explosives, the majority of the Galactic Empire's firepower comes in the form of highly heated particle bolts fired out of turbo lasers. These were incredibly powerful thermal projectiles that could melt through multiple layers of bulkhead. And because they were powered by some kind of gas or fuel, each ship could carry a relatively large amount of ammunition. Now, in our last video, we talked about some of the drawbacks for the turbo laser. Um, it's basically just a line of sight weapon. It's unguided, and over long distances, it usually lost power. But at close range, very few navies had ships that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial-class Star Destroyer in a broadside exchange. And in general, it's harder to shield and armor your ship from thermal energy weapons when compared to kinetic energy weapons. Another important weapon in the Imperial Arsenal was the Ion Cannon, or Ion Torpedo. These weapons spewed out high-speed ionized particles that wrecked havoc on enemy electrical systems and computer systems. An ion weapon could also take down a ship's shields and then disable their engines, life support, and weapons, leaving them virtually defenseless. While the Empire's enemies have routinely used ion weapons themselves against the Imperial fleet, the Galactic Empire also incorporated these weapons into their ships. Because ion weapons cause damage at the molecular level through its high-speed particles, it was almost impossible to properly shield equipment from it. Ion weapons also allowed the Galactic Empire to take out enemy forces with relatively low collateral damage. Now, despite what we see in the films, the Galactic Empire actually had some of the best pilots and officers in the entire galaxy. After the Clone Wars ended and the Jedi Order was wiped out, the Empire went through a process where it completely replaced its clone troopers with citizen soldiers. Imperial academies popped up across the galaxy and many different manufacturing industries and resources were nationalized. The government essentially created billions and billions of jobs overnight by increasing the size of the government and military. Eventually, local school systems were completely replaced by a galactic-wide system that eventually served as a pipeline for training Imperial pilots and officers. That meant that anyone with any talent or skill usually ended up in the Imperial Navy. For most people, especially outside the core regions of the galaxy, the best job they could wish for would be to be an officer in the Imperial Navy. While the overly competitive nature of these academies and officer corps sometimes led to destructive behavior, corruption, and infighting, it also produced some extremely deadly and capable officers. Most larger starships in the Galactic Empire Navy had reflow. Most larger ships in the Galactic Empire Navy had deflector shields, and these were incredibly robust types of defenses. These usually were made up of three different types of deflectors. There was the navigational shield, which protected the ship from space debris and other flotsam floating in space. Then there was a shield that blocked thermal energy weapons like plasma bolts from a turbo laser. And lastly, a shield that stopped kinetic energy like proton torpedoes or a suicidal A-wing. 
This gave the Galactic Empire a layered shield system that was incredibly flexible and could counter many different types of munitions. This was especially useful when they were encountering aliens for the first time. Compared to some of the other factions we're going to be talking about in this series, the Galactic Empire's average ship was massive. The Imperial-class Star Destroyer was one of the most prolific capital ships in the Empire, and it was 1.6 kilometers long, and the Navy fielded over 25,000 of them across the galaxy. Now, against a small mobile fleet of rebels, the Star Destroyer might have some problems, but against another larger traditional fleet like the ones we are comparing the Empire to in the series, there are very few navies who can stand up to the sheer firepower and size of the Galactic Empire Navy. For some more primitive navies, a 1.6 kilometer long Star Destroyer would be easily the largest ship in their entire force. Another advantage with the Galactic Empire was the majority of their ships had a contingent of Space Marines on board, aka Stormtroopers. The Stormtrooper Corps was technically a separate branch of the military from the Navy, but worked hand in hand with these larger ships. The Stormtrooper Corps relied on the Imperial Navy for transport and launching. In return, the Stormtrooper Corps could provide the Imperial Navy with capable ship security and very heavily armed ground teams. Larger ships like the Imperial Class Star Destroyer could hold an entire legion of Stormtroopers. Stormtroopers also specialized in breaching and taking over enemy ships, so in a pitched navy battle, these onboard personnel provided an Imperial commander with some creative options. As an outsider, if you looked at the Galactic Empire, you'd realize that this was an organization that was ready for total war. By nationalizing so many different industries and resources, the Galactic Empire was able to lower production costs by huge amounts. In the short term, the nationalization of the entire military-industrial complex increased jobs in certain areas while destroying all other non-military related jobs. In general, poverty would increase as wages would decrease. The middle class saw their purchasing power slide drastically. But Palpatine's most brilliant move is probably replacing the clones with imperial citizens. Because nothing starts a rebellion faster than having your civilian populace have high amounts of unemployment. I and mean, once your paycheck comes from the government and you're actively working for the military, you're much less likely to oppose it. The military first policy of the Galactic Empire probably destroyed many social institutions and generally made life worse for everyone in the galaxy, but it also made the Empire an incredibly formidable fighting force. As long as the Empire is fighting some existential threat, you can expect the Imperial Navy to put up a crazy fight against the enemies. The first flaw to discuss is the warp. Just about every single space navy out there has some form of faster than light travel, for without it, their forces wouldn't get far in the universe. In the Imperium of Man, faster than light travel is accomplished by way of the warp, a psychic dimension parallel to real space. Only one small issue, traveling through the warp is like the most dangerous thing one can possibly do in the entire universe, next to introducing your girlfriend to Sly Marbo. The warp is inhabited by the malevolent powers of chaos and their demonic servants. The warp and the realm of chaos within are corrupting, and any journey through the warp has a chance of being a treacherous one. Aside from the presence of the gods of chaos, the Imperial Navy faces other difficulties during warp travel as well, such as unexpected currents that can drive vessels off course and mammothly destructive raging storms. It's also impossible to detect the spatial movement of warp space once a ship is inside the warp, meaning that Navy crews are blind once in the warp and must trust their course to navigators. The good news is that aside from everything I just mentioned, the warp is completely safe. The next flaw is massive bureaucracy. 
The Imperium of Man at large is presided over by an infinitely complex, convoluted bureaucratic structure that no one can truly quite understand. It is 40k after all. In the case of the Imperial Navy, let's first note that the entire vast Imperium is divided into five fleet zones known as Segmente Majoris. Every starship of the Navy is then assigned to one of these Segmente, and falls under the command of a Lord High Admiral whose job it is to command the Imperial Navy assets of that Segmentum. Then, each Segmentum is divided into sectors. Sectors themselves are massive regions containing 8 million cubic light years of space. Then, sectors contain multiple subsectors, which are collections of star systems that can be up to 20 light years in radius. Each Segmentum has control over Imperial Navy starships, which are divided amongst the sectors into battle fleets. Now, the goal here isn't to break down the entire bureaucratic structure of the Navy but just to show that the physical and logistical obstacles separating a Lord High Admiral of a Segmente and, say, an Admiral of a Sector's fleet are great. With each level lower in the Navy hierarchy being eons of space away from the one above, by the time we get to the Admiral level, there is likely to be much disorganization and lack of cohesion among the ranks. The next flaw is implied by the last, massive territory. The Imperial Navy is responsible for their fleets of starships throughout the territories of mankind. This, in effect, means that they play a huge role in maintaining order throughout the Imperium of Man and must provide logistical support for the Imperial Guard across and even beyond its borders. Perhaps no force in space combat history has been presented with a mission of greater scope. Except for Sly Marbo. Chuck Norris makes Sly Marbo jokes. Both the Terran Federation Space Navy and Starship Troopers and the Colonial Marines and Aliens don't seem to have nearly the territory to cover. They occupy planets here and there, but the Imperium of Man consists of over one million inhabited worlds. This is almost an impossible amount of territory to cover simultaneously. The Navy must oversee logistics and combat over the entire Imperium, and is likely to be constantly spread thin and forced to pick and choose where to offer its strongest support. The next flaw is reserve fleets of the Segmentum Obscurus, the region of Imperial space that is home to the warp storm known as the Eye of Terror, the primary base for the forces of chaos in the Milky Way galaxy. One of the most important jobs of the Imperial Navy is to maintain substantial reserves of vessels around the Eye of Terror, in order to be prepared to deploy against the forces of chaos should need be. Interestingly enough, while the Imperial Guard never seems to be short on numbers, the Obscura Battle Fleet does not possess the manpower to maintain the number of reserve crews necessary to patrol the Eye of Terror. It is said that entire shipyards are filled with what are now antiquated vessels that were built for deployment in Segmentum Obscura. Should the need for a surge around the Eye of Terror arise, these older, inactive ships will be commissioned into service and often crewed with green recruits or ratings from destroyed ships. These servicemen are unlikely to have experience with their new vessel, and yet they are tasked with patrolling one of the most dangerous areas in the Imperium of Man. Again, this only happens in desperate situations, but the 40k universe is a perpetually desperate situation. Reserve fleets are prone to mass panics and mutiny, a vulnerability that Chaos War fleets can easily exploit. All in all, though not often discussed, the fact that the Imperial Navy is not quite fully capable of responding to warp havoc is one of the Imperium of Man's most significant flaws. The next flaw is battleships. Now, before you scream heretic, I am not here to insult the master vessels of the Imperial Navy. They are quite impressive. But if one aspect of the IN's fleet could be labeled inefficient, it would be their battleships. Okay, I'm here to insult them. Battleships are massive spacecraft. I mean, we are talking between six and eight kilometers long and can carry tens to hundreds of thousands of soldiers. They are well-armed and armored, limitlessly powerful machines, and usually take on the role of flagship for an Imperial Lord Admiral. But the battleships have their issues. For one, with size comes a reduction in speed and maneuverability, and indeed, battleships like the Emperor-class battleship are slow and cumbersome. And battleships are also expensive to build and maintain, meaning they require cautious handling and care. Unfortunately, this means that battleships are usually only deployed as part of larger fleet formations and in the most important battles, and don't have much versatility in terms of use. It's great that battleships are unstoppable forces of man's creation, 
but if they drain the resources of the Imperium, more efficient alternatives need to be considered for the long-term benefit of mankind. The next flaw is rank and file. The Imperial Navy has very proficient officers. But below them, the Imperial Navy isn't really made up of highly skilled and specialized recruits. The basic enlisted crewmen aboard warships are called ratings. Ratings carry out menial tasks like hauling weapons, cleaning, and maintenance, and even fight when necessary. Ratings are volunteers as the pay is good enough and the Navy allows them to escape their desperate worlds. So it's not like they were dragged into the Navy, but they aren't very impressive either. Armsmen transport and maintain weapons on a ship and protect the crew when called to do so. Voidsmen, on the other hand, possess at least minimal training and skill and can perform ship maintenance and repairs. But neither of these groups consist of irreplaceable soldiers who add significant value to a naval crew. The Imperial Guard is defined by its specialist soldiers and elite units, where the Navy is defined by its elite ships, which is the most important thing for a Navy to have, but it's sorely lacking in terms of the individual crewmen. This brings us to our next flaw, which is indentured servants. Indentured servants, or slave workers, fall below the ratings in terms of rank. They are taken from slums and penal colonies to do hard labor aboard naval vessels. They are dragged to the Navy. These poor souls often die as a result of malnutrition, accidents, and disciplinary actions. Basically, they exist to die for the fun of everyone else, and can do little to improve their station in life. Though I have heard The Rock is going to star in a movie called Warp Ninjas about an indentured servant from a hive world who rises to become a Lord High Admiral. But I digress. Manpower is good. But the kinds of conditions that the lower ranks of the Imperial Navy face aboard vessels is not conducive to producing strong, loyal, and skilled soldiers. And perhaps on the contrary, puts any given naval ship at high risk of mutiny. The next flaw to discuss is Space Hulks. Space Hulks are formed from the wreckage of abandoned starships and debris that have been fused together by the forces of the warp, and often are so large that they have their own atmosphere and gravity. Kind of like my first girlfriend, except Space Hulks don't have beards. The Imperial Navy often loses ships, and when they do, what remains is at risk of becoming part of a Space Hulk. And Space Hulks pose a threat to the Imperium of Man, where they exit the warp back into real space. The forces of Chaos, and even Xenos, often inhabit these Hulks, and have to be destroyed by the Imperial Navy. And because no Hulk is the same as another, it's hard for the Navy to model them for assault planning purposes. Hulks present a uniquely challenging threat to the Imperial Navy. The next flaw is a lack of intelligence capabilities. The Imperial Navy does have a branch that handles intelligence, but it's not quite clear how much they're able to accomplish. Though little is known about them, it is thought that they at least control a militarized spy network. During the Sabbat World's Crusade, Navy intelligence operatives discovered a plot being carried out by Lord High Militant General Hector Draver to advance his career using malicious methods that would allow him to usurp the position of War Master from Marshal Makarov the naval intelligence operatives were able to act in time to deal with the issue. That said, this event only represents intelligence gathering concerning human dealings. Due to the scope of territory in the Imperium of Man and the amount of different species and threats they deal with, it's likely that naval intelligence doesn't provide the Navy with much of an advantage, and even if they had the manpower and resources to spy on their enemies effectively, they would still need time to communicate their findings back through the naval hierarchy anyway, sans an astropath at the ready. And of course, spying on enemy Xenos requires alien language skills as well, and the last time I checked, Rosetta Stone's website did not feature a Dark Tongue course, though they do offer something called Dari, which I think is an orc language. The last flaw is a lack of uniformity. The Imperial Navy's battle fleets share little in common with each other. Even fleets within the same segmentum can vary significantly from sector to sector. These fleets have been separate from one another and evolving on their own for millennia according to their own needs. A battle fleet in Segmentum Solar could look very different from a battle fleet in Segmentum Tempestus. Both fleets will have been shaped by different environments, enemies, battles, and peoples. This means that it's very hard for Lord High Admirals to understand the units they have command over or know how to best use their forces. 
Battlefleet Cadia, for instance, faces constant war thanks to the unrest surrounding the Cadian Gate, and thus is a very active fleet, likely to have a much higher number of inexperienced ratings due to the constant losses they experience, and also are probably more prepared for conflict than other fleets as well. The first advantage is cruisers. In the Flaws video, we took some time to criticize Imperial Navy battleships for being slow and cumbersome, and for the expensive resources required to build them that makes them a rare sight. Cruisers make up for the shortcomings of the battleship, at least in terms of capabilities. Cruisers, a mainstay in the Imperial Navy fleet, are not as powerful as battleships, but are much faster and still extremely offensively capable. They are more agile than a battleship, but more powerful than an escort, boasting the firepower, speed, and maneuverability for a variety of different missions from patrols to raids to all-out war. Whoa. Whoa. Sorry. Thought Sly Marbo was behind me for a second. There are a variety of different types and classes of cruisers, but they usually are between 4 and 6 kilometers long and can hold anywhere between 10,000 and 1 million crewmen. Light cruisers favor speed and maneuverability, while heavy cruisers favor defense and firepower. Then there's the more antiquated Grand Cruiser that is a solid mix of a cruiser and a battleship and can be used in a range of ways, from heavy raider, given its speed, to flagship. The next advantage to talk about is what I believe might be the advantage that separates the 40k Imperial Navy from all other space navies. The battle fleets of Segmentum Obscurus. Why is it that a small country like Israel, for instance, is so advanced in terms of its military capabilities? Well, it exists in close proximity to many threats, and this has driven them to focus on developing their military throughout their history. Segmentum Obscurus is the home of the Eye of Terror, a warp storm and warp rift of psychic energy 20,000 light years across that houses the largest concentration of the forces of chaos in real space. The most malevolent and abhorred demons of chaos break free into real space constantly from the Eye of Terror. The Bastion fleets, Cadia, Agrippina, Scarus, and Corona, and even to a degree Battlefleet Gothic, exist in a perpetual state of warfare. They eat nightmares for breakfast, darkness for lunch, and death for dinner. And that's on a good day. This constant state of hell has led these fleets to become the most hardened, the most prepared, the most adept in the Imperium of Man. The Bastion fleets put the shield in Holy Shield. Battlefleet Cadia guards the Cadian Gate, the literal exit of the Eye of Terror. Can you imagine if they had the luck of trading universes with navies from other science fiction franchises? The Galactic Empire would be the equivalent of a luxury vacation for the 40k Imperial Navy after dealing with the abominable and corrupting forces of chaos that spill forth from the warp's rectum to poison the hearts and minds of man, tearing him apart from both the inside out and outside in. Put up against any other naval force, the Obscurus battle fleets would rain down hell on their opposition, not out of an untempered aggression, but out of a supreme vigilance and desensitization to total war and the most depraved forces of evil in any existence. The next advantage to discuss is one we've mentioned before, Forge Worlds. Forge Worlds are entire planets dedicated to the manufacture of machines, weapons, and other technology. Yes, it takes an unreasonable amount of time and resources to construct ships in the 40k universe, and yet, they have an abundance of them. Having entire planets run by the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Imperium entity employing scientists, engineers, and technicians, and charged with overseeing the Imperium's technology, allows the Navy to have the requisite vehicles to maintain a presence throughout the entire Milky Way galaxy. I don't want to overly compliment the Adeptus Mechanicus, they hold back the Imperium in many ways, but Forge Worlds are a plus. Forge Worlds are the explanation for how the Imperium is able to have an extraordinary amount of just about everything, including massive ships which are typically constructed in large shipyards orbiting the Forge Worlds. The next advantage is the Fury Interceptor. The Fury, an attack craft used for void combat, is the most common starfighter in the Imperial Navy's employ. Housed by the thousands on cruisers, battleships, and other carriers, the Fury Interceptor is a very versatile ship, and can be used as a fighter, as an interceptor that shoots down enemy torpedoes and bombers, as a scout and reconnaissance ship, 
or as an escort for the Imperial Navy's Starhawk bombers during their own assaults. Furies can even attack planetary targets within an atmosphere. But being that they range between 40 and 70 meters in length, they are best used in space. The Fury is also well armed, with all of its patterns able to be equipped with high explosive anti-starship missiles and several banks of forwards firing LAS cannons. Naturally, our next advantage is atmospheric aircraft. After the Horus Heresy, the Imperial Navy was broken up into the Imperial Guard and Imperial Navy. The Navy was given control over all aviation and air support capability, including atmospheric aircraft, the two anchors of which are the Lightning and Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt is the flying man's aircraft. It's gritty, well-armed and armored, and altogether well-rounded. It has good speed and maneuverability, powerful nose-mounted weapons, and missile loadouts on its wings. The Thunderbolt is primarily an air superiority fighter, seeking out and engaging enemy aircraft. But like many other Navy ships, it's also very versatile and can be used in multiple roles, including as a high altitude escort fighter, a low altitude fighter bomber, or even as a reconnaissance aircraft. The Lightning, on the other hand, is even faster and more agile than the Thunderbolt, but gives up a bit in terms of armor. The Lightning is armed with a single ventral mounted long barreled autocannon two wing-mounted LAS cannons, and four wing-mounted Hellstrike missiles. The Lightning is primarily used as a reconnaissance aircraft or an interceptor. The aircraft is able to perform short takeoff and landing, allowing it to be scrambled quickly during an enemy attack. The Lightning is also capable of limited space flight in a vacuum and atmospheric re-entry, and thus it can be launched from Imperial starships in orbit. The next advantage is Astropaths. I know we previously hated on the Imperial Guard for a lack of communication technology, but most space forces would face difficulties in trying to communicate between the millions of planets and ships encompassed by the Imperium across the entire Milky Way galaxy. At least the Imperium of Man has psychic beings called Astropaths, who make such communication possible. Astropaths use their telepathic abilities to carry out superluminal communication and thus link mankind throughout the galaxy. After being honorably selected slash kidnapped into the Imperium's employ, they are then dutifully trained slash tortured in order to better resist the forces of chaos in a process called soul binding. This allows the Astropaths to enter their minds into the warp and transmit communications throughout the galaxy in an instant without being corrupted by the evil forces of Immaterium. In terms of the Imperial Navy, warships often have a chief astropath along with an astropathic choir on board who are responsible for maintaining adequate long-range communications. That said, they can do more than just long-range communication. They have many other advantages they add to a naval crew as well, such as the ability to control the minds of gunners on enemy ships, or the ability to dull their own crew's primal instincts to make them fearless, earning astropaths the nickname Vodka of the Skies. The next advantage is navigators. Navigators are human mutants who possess the navigator gene, giving them the ability to navigate starships through warp space. Navigators have a third eye called a warp eye on their foreheads, which allows them to sense the tides of the warp. As we discussed in the flaws video, naval crews can't detect the spatial movement of warp space once their ship is inside the warp. Thus, without navigators, warp travel would be nearly impossible and the Imperium would likely fall. Navigators can also live up to 400 Terran years, and as they age, their abilities increase in power. Now, navigators aren't only an advantage because of the warp, all space navies have to deal with some form of warp space or black holes, and navigators could most likely direct ships through any such entity and more. They are basically the 40K version of the smartphone. The next advantage is offensive weapon systems. Imperial Navy starships are very well armed and feature a variety of extraordinarily powerful weapons. First, there's the Disruption Macro Cannon, which fires a shell of highly charged ionized deuterium atoms, which overload and shut down power transfer systems throughout target ships, allowing users to capture enemies alive and ships intact. Then there are lances, which are powerfully directed energy weapons, or basically giant LAS guns that can destroy even the most well-armed ships. The Navy also employs torpedoes, which are gigantic self-propelled ship-to-ship -ship missiles with enormous destructive power. While certainly somewhat easily evaded, naval captains use torpedoes to get enemy ships to move in specific directions. Lastly, we have Nova Cannons. 
limitlessly powerful weapons mounted below the front of Navy cruisers and battleships. Nova cannons are mostly unrivaled in terms of destructive potential and can create a blast capable of leveling multiple starships. Remember, in 40k it's not the size of the boat that matters, nor the motion of the ocean. It's the size of the gun, and whether or not you can fire it before a chaos demon convinces you to rip your spleen out through your ear. Our next advantage comes on the defensive side of things. Void Shields. Void Shields are protective barriers of gravitic or electrically charged energy that form an invisible band around naval vessels that can absorb radiation, interstellar dust, particle showers, and sustained weapons fire. They displace ranged attacks by subtly distorting the localized space-time around the point of impact. Void Shields are not great protection in close combat, but with the colossal size of Imperial Navy ships, much Void combat is done at range, where Void Shields are most protective. Void shields are unique defense systems that encompass the entire vessel, a great advantage even relative to many other space navies. Our final advantage is universal reverence. It may be true that it is nearly impossible for the Imperial Navy to keep track of all the Imperium's territory and for its leaders to know the peoples and planets of any part of their jurisdiction well enough to dictate intelligent orders down to the lower ranks. But what they can almost always rely on when dealing in different parts of the galaxy is the dedicated support of the rest of mankind. Thanks to the Navigator's connection to the Golden Throne and the Warp, the Ecclesiarchy, the State Church of the Imperium, preaches that the Imperial Navy fleet is an extension of the Emperor of Mankind's divine will and is therefore sacred. Thus, on many Imperial planets, the Imperial Navy is considered holy and deserving of the absolute compliance of Imperial subjects. This eases the burden of the Navy of carrying out operations in unfamiliar Imperium territories. The Separatist Alliance, or Confederacy of Independent Systems, finds its roots in a loose coalition of trade and commerce guilds, mainly focused in the outer rims of the galaxy. Because of centuries of neglect and lack of federal spending, the outer rim was never able to develop much commerce and wealth like the inner colonies of the galaxy. A lot of this was due to the fact that there was just a lack of infrastructure in the outer rims, and there was also a lack of rule of law. Pirates and bandits were common in the region, and they preyed on all types of shipping. There are plenty of worlds in the Outer Rim that were ready to be explored and resources ready to be exploited, but it would take a huge upfront investment and a lot of security to make sure this kind of operation would go smoothly. The Republic at the time was demilitarized and only had a small force of judicials who just weren't well-funded or numerous enough to patrol the Outer Rim. So instead, the Senate proposed a free trade area in the Outer Rim to give large corporations more of an incentive to make objectively risky investments in developing the Outer Rim. The program was relatively successful. The private sector was able to do something that the Republic couldn't, mainly because they had more cash flow and capital to be able to sustain these investments. Overnight, resource-rich worlds were settled and industrial powerhouses began emerging as a new supply supply chain in the Outer Rim began to be the primary driver in growth in the Republic. Kind of like China in the 2000s. Now, not everything was great, of course, this was pure capitalism with very little to no government regulation. You had organizations like the Trade Federation taking over services and utilities that are usually government run or at least regulated. It's not surprising that the Trade Federation was accused of price hiking and pressing local citizens into essentially indentured servitude. In the decades leading to the Clone Wars, the Republic moved to end the free trade zone that had been present for several decades now. You had many different type of trade organizations that were functioning on a business model that relied completely on a tax break. The effect of no free trade zone was so devastating to the bottom lines of these organizations that it would eventually lead to the start of the Confederacy of Independent Systems. These corporate interests believed that they were responsible for developing the outer rim and they deserved to have this tax cut. After all, they were the ones to make their risky initial investment. Most of the services and security forces in the Outer Rim were also run by private companies. The Republic, without a military presence in the region, was about to tax a region of space where they had relatively little influence and didn't really provide any service. So the Separatist Alliance formed as a breakaway confederacy, and they weren't really all that ideological. I mean, these were essentially corporations that had decided that their bottom line was being heavily affected by Republic policy that they deemed as unfair. This meant the Separatist military forces were were not ideological either, and more focused on preserving their own economic interests. This means as a whole though, the Separatists have a huge weakness. If you're able to attack their commerce and business holdings with enough sanctions and military actions, it's very likely you're going to win the war. 
At the end of the day, a businessman is always willing to negotiate because they understand the language of money. The lack of ideology means that the Separatist forces were mainly made up of droids. Separatist leaders weren't military people and shied away from the front lines and usually appointed mercenaries to lead their armies. These mercenaries were usually highly competent and experienced, but their loyalty was available for the highest bidder. These individuals were usually keen on self-preservation and weren't really attached to any type of cause. There's also a general lack of accountability when it comes to employing a mercenary, but at the same time, mercenary leaders don't necessarily see themselves as part of a command chain, which means that they can disobey orders if they want to, or even quit a job in the middle of the battle with little consequences. When everything is just about money, it makes things a lot simpler, but it also makes it a lot easier to persuade someone to change sides. The majority of the Separatist Navy finds their roots in the mercantile fleets of the Trade Federation and other corporate interests. This means most of the Separatist Navy is made up of converted commercial and industrial ships. If we look at the Lucre Hulk battleship, it is essentially one gigantic freighter repurposed as a troop carrier slash capital ship. What you end up having is a ship designed to carry a huge amount of cargo, which creates extra surface space that needs to be defended, covered in shields, and point defense weaponry. These are essentially bolt-on battleships, and bolt-on creations will never beat a purpose-built machine like a Venator-class Star Destroyer. Now, obviously, the Separatist Alliance made up for these inefficiencies in their ship designs by deploying very efficient droid troops, but we'll talk more about that in our next video. But the strange thing is, even though the Separatist Alliance uses droids, which are cheaper and easier to maintain in field, their ships are still built for organics. All Separatist ships still have physical bridges with individual consoles that need to be controlled by an operator. This, of course, is complicated by the use of traditional interfaces like buttons and keypads. This is really completely unnecessary. A droid should be able to plug straight into a computer without any kind of physical interface. Ideally, most Separatist ships shouldn't need a bridge at all because it provides a vulnerable target for enemy forces. Instead, you can have a heavily fortified control center at the center of your ship, or maybe several droid AI brains scattered across the ship for redundancy purposes. This also makes a lot of the infrastructure in the ship unnecessary. Why does a droid-run ship need hallways, different decks, when all interactions can happen through a computer system? There's really no need to physically move around the ship at all. Instead of running on gas or some other fuel, the Separatist turbo lasers ran on turbo laser shells. These larger projectiles were loaded manually into a turbo laser, significantly decreasing the fire rate, while at the same time increasing the size and weight of all the ammunition. These firing positions also required a crew that would fire, aim, and reload. This was obviously something that could be automated, and we see this in other ships in the Star Wars galaxy. Some Separatist ships even had their turbo lasers fixed in position, and these were used in broadside exchanges, which seems completely out of place in this more technologically advanced galaxy. Separatist fighters are mainly known for their speed, maneuverability, and low cost. And they're primarily used for defensive purposes simply because they lack any real range. For instance, the Vulture droids use a solid fuel slug, not all that different from the ones used in rocket boosters for the Space Shuttle program. And while these solid fuel slugs were quite potent and powerful, they only lasted for 35 minutes, which meant that the operational range for a Vulture droid fighter was comically low, especially for something that was flying in the vastness of space. This is why the Vulture droid was limited to just a defensive purpose. It was said during the Clone Wars, veteran clone pilots were able to predict the movement of AI droid fighters. This was due to the limited AI on these ships. While efficient and more than capable of overwhelming an enemy, the droid fighters were quite predictable and would fall into specific attack patterns and routines. For the most part, Starfighter doctrine in the Separatist Alliance was all about quantity over quality. This limited their ability as a fighting force and also limited their options during a battle. The majority of Separatist ships functioned with what most organic fleets would call a skeleton crew. Ships like the Munificent class frigate barely had any bulkhead or armor at all simply because there was nothing to protect on board. This also naturally meant that Separatist ships had very little security, which is why the Jedi were able to time and time again infiltrate Separatist capital ships and encountered very little opposition. Most navies would have an onboard security detail, but most Separatist ships just had deactivated battle droids that weren't necessarily in use. Simply put, the Separatist Alliance was very weak against Space Marines. Aside from heroes like General Grievous or Admiral Trench, the majority of Separatist forces were led by commander droids, who were pretty incompetent, and like the AI brains, the AI brains of the droid fighters, relatively easy to exploit and predict. 
It's like playing a video game. Even with the AI on its highest difficulty level, you'll begin to see patterns over time and begin to exploit its flaws. Once the commander droids are taken out, all you have left are lower level droids with very little strategic programming or tactical knowledge. Although they are relatively efficient at running their individual operations, they lack the creativity and spark to outmaneuver enemy forces. And the reason behind this is that the Separatist Alliance has purposely capped the processing power of the individual battle droid. For one, it keeps manufacturing costs down, and perhaps more importantly, it makes the droids easier to control. The last thing you really want to have with your droid army is for them to become sentient and then overthrow your rule. By making the average droid in the Separatist Navy relatively harmless on their own, it gives the Separatist Council a more predictable fighting force. The only people that they really need to try Trust and watch are the individuals they assign to lead these battle forces. What they sacrifice, though, are capable NCOs and junior officers that an organic army would depend on. These are redundant measures put into place in case your commanding officer dies. NCOs and junior officers are still able to lead their men to an objective. This also meant that Separatist leaders with their top-down leadership structure had to micromanage. This meant that the Separatist Navy was not as flexible or capable of responding quickly to enemy threats, which goes against everything we know about complex AI, which reinforces the point that the Separatists have put garbage tech running the AI in their droids. In our last episode, we talked about how short the range of the average droid ship was, which essentially relegates them to a defensive role. Besides this short range, these droid fighters were arguably much better than the ones that the clones fielded. For one, it took the JAR 10 years to grow and train a clone pilot. It took the Separatist Alliance Navy probably an hour to produce a vulture droid. And even though one clone piloted starfighter can defeat a single vulture droid in battle, that clone pilot will definitely lose against 10 vulture droids. A droid starfighter core was simply cheaper to maintain and easier and quicker to produce. Droid ships were also generally smaller than a piloted ship because they didn't have a cockpit, life support, additional shielding and armor around the pilot, and other safety features like inertial dampeners to limit G-forces and ejection seats. Droids therefore had better power to weight ratio and were more maneuverable. One of the most terrifying weapons in the Separatist Alliance Navy was known as the Buzz Droid. Usually fired out of some kind of canister or missile, these were clusters of droid ships that specifically were designed to latch onto enemy ships and cut through the hull, disabling crucial systems and eventually venting the entire craft into vacuum. This was an incredibly terrifying ordeal for organics in a smaller single seat fighter. Very few ships actually had countermeasures to defend against these kind of weapons. All one could do is wait for them to cut through your hull and kill you. And because of the way they were developed and their diminutive size, it was relatively hard to see them on the battlefield. And oftentimes pilots didn't realize they had picked up a buzz droid until it was already doing damage to major critical systems on board. Even when the war was over, there were still many active clusters of buzz droids flying around the galaxy, which proved to be a huge problem for civilian shipping. These were basically space landmines that could only be defeated by Space Princess Diana. The Severus Navy happened to be one of the few factions that heavily relied on missile technology. Missiles were relatively expensive when compared to turbo lasers and other energy weapons, but they more than made up for in performance. See, missiles don't work on a line of sight principle. They could go around obstruction and they could travel extremely long distances and allow a ship to attack another ship without necessarily exposing themselves to counterattack. This is especially true in the Star Wars universe where most of the Separatist Alliance's enemies use line of sight turbo lasers. The payload on a missile was also far more powerful than a turbo laser, although countermeasures were oftentimes more effective against a missile than energy weapons. What made the Separatist Navy so dangerous was that it had line of sight weapons and also missiles. It gave them a lot of options when encountering an enemy. For a force that had a huge weakness against ionic attacks and EMP pulses, the Separatists definitely invested heavily in this technology for their own ships. The command ship Malevolence incorporated a gigantic ionic cannon that could disable an entire fleet on its own. This was an unprecedented amount of firepower for one single ship. I'd argue it's a much more useful weapon against fleets than a Death Star's main laser weapon. The Separatists also used a variety of ion bombs, ion cannons, and ion torpedoes. Combine that with everything else we've talked about, like the buzz droids, the missiles, and the turbo lasers, and you have an incredibly, incredibly dangerous force. The Separatist Navy was first and foremost an offensive military with an immense amount of destructive power. 
the Imperial class Star Destroyer could hold a legion of stormtroopers, around 9,000 men. This is a lot of people if you think about it. Not only do you have to house these individuals, you also need to feed them and give them recreation areas. During the Republic era, some clones were stored in stasis pods to save space on ships. But the B-1 battle droid, which I had as a Legno Technic form as a kid, folds up neatly into a small shape. While in the sleep mode, they would recharge and update their software. They took a very little space, so even the smallest capital ships in the droid army could hold a ridiculous amount of troops on board. The Munificent class frigate could hold 150,000 B-1 battle droids, while large Larger vessels like the Luke or Hulk battleships could hold closer to a million, and the Providence class command ship could hold 1.5 million. This meant that the Separatists could move around massive amounts of troops with relative ease. And should they be really desperate in the middle of a Navy battle, they could just board an enemy ship. Doesn't matter how much more powerful and larger an Imperial class Star Destroyer is compared to a Munificent Frigate, because those 150,000 battle droids will definitely beat 9,000 stormtroopers. The Separatist Alliance had a much smaller population when compared with the Republic, and all the new worlds that joined the Separatist Alliance during the beginning of the Clone Wars were also smaller colonies. This is why the droids had been chosen in the first place. Heavy civilian casualties were just not sustainable for the Separatist Alliance. The Separatist droid army and navy for the most part was expendable. There was rarely any backlash over the loss of an entire fleet or army. The Separatist leaders saw them as acceptable business expenses or losses. Stop it! What should we do? You stay here. I'll be back. Oh, that's great. This emotional detachment to their troops meant that the Separatist Alliance was very cold and calculating and also very goal-oriented during a battle. This meant that the Navy was more focused and was alright with sacrificing entire portions of the fleet if it served the mission. There are a lot of advantages of having droids crew your entire ship. As we mentioned before, it saves space. Droids are also pretty immune to normal space travel dangers like cosmic radiation, exposure to vacuum, and cold. This meant that hull breaches and other structural damage usually had less of an effect on a Separatist crew. And should you need to repair the ship, a droid could just walk out of an airlock and basically do the repairs without any kind of protective equipment or life support. Technically speaking, Separatist ships didn't even need light support at all, or gravity. This was simply put in because most Separatist ships started out life as a merchant or commerce vessel, which were usually run by a small crew of organic officers. Droids also didn't get fatigued or needed to be rotated in shifts. They were basically perfect for space navies. Private industry will usually do things twice as fast, twice as cheap, and twice as unethical when compared to the public sector. The Separatist Alliance, being run by a coalition of private corporations, probably ran their military in the same way as a business, with efficiency and focus on performance and cost savings. As a government, the Separatists also put into place heavy censorship of what was actually going on in the war, covering up details about Separatist losses or war crimes committed by the droid armies and navies. This combined with almost no civilian casualties meant that the Separatist Alliance was very resilient to war fatigue. As long as the Separatist Alliance continued acquiring assets, aka new worlds and their resources, they could continue absorbing losses and carry on the fighting. Although few in numbers, the organic generals and admirals the Separatists did have definitely outclassed their Jedi counterparts when it came to strategy and tactics. This is it. Your first command. Don't be nervous. I wish everyone would stop saying that. I'm ordering you to return to the ship. We're going to need your help. Ahsoka, it's too risky. Get your pilots out of there. Sir, we've got their fighters surrounded. Good. It's too late! Run for it! Most of the Confederacy planets were located in the Outer Rim, where planetary defense forces were much more important and active at fighting bandits and pirates. This meant unlike the Jedi, the Separatist generals and admirals actually had battle experience prior to the war. I have seen his work firsthand. A corporate fleet was blockading Malastare. A fleet led by Trench. That's why I recognize the tactics. He tore our ships apart. We barely escaped with our lives. Because most of the central worlds in the Confederacy were located in the free trade zone that had been put in place almost a century before, this also meant that most Separatist central worlds were heavily industrialized. Like we said in our last video, it was basically the China of the galaxy, a massive manufacturing powerhouse that produced a huge amount of diverse products for the rest of the galaxy. 
One of the major reasons why they wanted to end the free trade zone was because mid-rim and core-rim worlds were unable to compete with the outer rim anymore. Not only were there no taxes on these worlds, there was more access to natural resources and land was far cheaper to develop. A lack of regulation also meant that corporations were untethered by ethical and safety concerns. It was the ultimate free market capitalist society. This meant that the Separatist Alliance could produce droids and ships at a ridiculously fast rate. If Chancellor Palpatine had been involved with the Separatist Alliance Navy secretly, then the Republic probably would have lost the war within a month. The war has begun. Excellent. Everything is going as planned. If you look at the numbers, they just don't add up. At the Battle of Geonosis, the Grand Army of the Clones had 200,000 troopers, while the Separatist Alliance had over 5 million droids. Like Russia or the United States in World War II, the Separatist Alliance has huge industrial capacity that they quickly militarized, turning them into an unstoppable force. The first flaw to discuss is carriers. Carriers are heavy warships that serve as command centers for fleet commanders. Now those of you in the know will say that carriers are very powerful ships. And that isn't untrue. They are heavily armed and protected by plasma shields. They also have the versatility of being able to operate in atmospheric conditions or deep space. Though losing importance due to the rise with Void Ray, carriers play a central role in Protoss fleet maneuvers. The issue with carriers is offensive capability. The ships have purifier beams that are used for glassing or planet cracking. However, carriers have no other armament aside from interceptors. There seems to be no reason for the lack of lighter offensive weaponry that can be used for smaller scale combat in space. Carriers are also slow and bulky, and these weaknesses have been exploited by the Zerg. Many have speculated that the reason the carrier is still even in use at all is due to the Protoss reverence for the ship, meaning that their non-progressive society is partly to blame for this flaw. The next flaw is that the Protoss are not very unified. As collectivist as the Protoss might be, throughout their history they have had trouble keeping all of the members of their race united under a single set of beliefs and fighting together as one. Millions of years ago, a group of Protoss were led away from the rest of their Protoss kindred by an evil Zelnaga named Amon. These Protoss are called the Taldarum, or the Forged, and have evolved to be a fanatical warlike sect of Protoss. There were also rogue Protoss in StarCraft prehistory who refused to submit to the Kala the main religion of the Kalai, the most common of the Protoss kindreds. These rogues were exiled by the Kalai and became known as the Nerezim, or the Dark Templar, a group that cuts off their psionic appendages as a rejection of the collective and their literal connection to it, and has evolved over time to be much more individualistic than the Kalai. Yeah, self-amputation. You just got owned, Kalai. All of these different groups have different strengths, abilities, beliefs, and behaviors. This in itself isn't a flaw, but that the Kalai don't necessarily foster loyalty and fealty in every Protoss is possibly a reflection of a flawed system of citizen cultivation. The Protoss are not able to harness the full alien power of their race. The next flaw is the psionic matrix. A psionic matrix refers to the circular matrix used to provide power to Protoss buildings, allowing them to produce units and research upgrades. Many might consider the psionic matrix to be an advantage because it allows for the instant deployment of troops and buildings to the battlefield. But the problem is that the Protoss heavily depend on these matrices for power. If a Protoss structure loses connection with the matrix, it will shut down until it's reconnected, meaning that through the matrix the Protoss are vulnerable. When the term psionic matrix is used, what comes to mind is the major one that was on the Protoss homeworld of Ire. This matrix, a network of crystals embedded in the crust of the planet that generated and spread psionic energy throughout the Corporulus sector of space, had to be destroyed to prevent the malevolent Zelnaga Amon from warping in the Golden Armada. The dismantling of the Psi Matrix put the Protoss force in jeopardy. Furthermore, the Protoss would need to build a matrix anywhere in space they went in order to maintain power for their fleet and ground forces, and thus the Protoss are most effective in their home sector where they don't have to prepare these structures. The matrices are basically interplanetary colostomy bags, without which the Protoss can't do sh**. And even with an abundance of matrices, they still make prime targets for enemies. I suppose they had no other choice though. Well, aside from solar power. The next flaw to discuss is that the Protoss are a declining population. Sure, the Protoss can live for up to a thousand years, but they have a low population regardless thanks to constant conflict. 
they're somewhat of an impotent race as well that don't seem to reproduce much. I could give the Protoss a harder time for this, but to be fair, their females seem to lack holes. Their lack of numbers forces them to use robots in their military and for production of resources, of which they do not have an abundance of. In itself, a result of limited population. Of course, a lack of alien power also means a lack of numbers on the battlefield as well. One might expect with more Protoss to fight in battle, with more weapons and resources, and with a unified race, the Protoss would dominate against the Zerg and Terrans. The next flaw is a lack of skilled crew members. From the shuttle to the Phoenix, the Protoss have a great number of capable ships. The Great Fleet is replete with advanced warships and aircraft of all sorts. They are technologically advanced enough to dominate space and atmospheric warfare. However, because the Protoss population is in decline, there is a lack of ready and able Protoss to alien these ships. Most notably, skilled pilots are in short supply, meaning that despite advanced technology, the ships have to be supplemented with robot droid power. This makes Protoss pilots integral parts of a ship's crew, and if something happens to them, an entire mission, or even the ship itself, could be in jeopardy. The next flaw is collectivism and conformity. The Kalai, the central Protoss faction, does not place heavy emphasis on the individual. For much of their history, Protoss society was organized into a caste system before being abolished by Protoss leader Artanis. This has helped to reinforce a class-based mentality in its subjects that robs them of their individuality and promotes the state first. This is what led to the Dark Templar in the first place. Thus, many Kalai don't aspire to rise above their brothers and prosper, and thus Protoss society is most likely not commoditizing the talents of its inhabitants or incentivizing its population to think creatively and be innovative. The Kalai have achieved advanced technology nonetheless, but one can only assume their accomplishments would be far greater if they reinforced conformity less and allowed more talented and creative individuals to rise. This brings us to our next flaw, which is that the Protoss are slow to accept change. Any religious society is going to be more conservative than others, and this is no different for the Protoss. The Kala is a rigid doctrine of belief, and the Kalai fear deviating from their religious tenets. This is seen clearly in their rejection of the Nazarim, who could have been valuable members of society, but instead were exiled because of their lack of faith. The Protoss are liable to put the Kala before their best interests, a vulnerability that their enemies can exploit. The Protoss follow the religious principles of Dai Ul, Great Stewardship, and Kala, Path of Ascension. These principles make the Protoss an honorable race, but also make them act against their own best interests at times, such as in protecting weaker races in the galaxy, rather than using their time and resources to mobilize themselves into a supreme fighting force. This leads us to our next flaw, which is a lack of female Protoss in important positions. Among the Kalai, female Protoss are rarely seen in positions of power and don't play a significant role in Protoss society. Many Protoss even look down on Terran women, but to be fair, the only one they've ever really had contact with ended up turning into the devil and trying to kill them all. Contrast that with my ex and me and the Protoss have plenty in common. But I digress. I'm not saying that as a general rule, if females are not in combat positions, the society in question is flawed. What I am saying, however, is that the breakaway Protoss, the Nerezim, do have a prominent position for females called Matriarch, and the females in this role have proven to be highly valuable assets. Razagal was the Matriarch of the Nerezim, and she proved to be one of the most powerful psychics in the galaxy, and was known for her stoicism and calmness in times of great chaos. And the current Matriarch, Vorazun, is a skilled warrior able to teleport around the battlefield, killing multiple enemies at once. The Kalai and their rape culture are, as usual, limiting their own potential by holding women down in society. The next flaw up is robots. The Protoss are not a prolific race and thus need assistance to produce things and fight on the battlefield. Thus, Protoss military capability often relies on automated robotic war machines. With such ubiquitous use of robots, they entrust huge responsibility to non-Protoss entities, entities not necessarily loyal to their cause that pose the threat of uprising. The Purifiers are a robotic race created by the Protoss to replicate the greatest warriors in Protoss history. Given that the aim with the Purifiers was to create a fighting force elite even for Protoss, 
Protoss standards, their creation was a serious risk. Indeed, during the Protoss Empire, the purifiers rebelled and had to be put down by the Protoss. Then there is the Colossi, massive robotic walkers designed by the Protoss to destroy large numbers of ground targets. Colossi are a bit antiquated at this point in StarCraft history, which is probably for the best because some Protoss believe they could not be controlled and could also end up rebelling against them. If the Zerg don't get the Protoss, their own robots might. A lesson we can all learn from, especially those of us who own Roombas. The last advantage is simple, a lack of diversity of enemies. Sure, the Protoss have existed for millions of years, but over that time their main threat has been the Zerg, a race that while having variation among its breeds, is still somewhat homogeneous as an enemy. Now that we've covered Warhammer on this channel, it's only fair to judge other factions relative to the factions in the 40k universe, where the enemies are incredibly powerful and of various different forms, species, and dimensions. The Protoss know how to fight the Zerg, but if confronted with other threats, it's unknown how they'd fare. The first advantage to discuss is the Protoss Mothership. The three kilometer long Mothership is a massive Protoss support vessel that served as the flagship of the famed Golden Armada. At the core of the Mothership is a huge Kadaran crystal infused with psionic energy that allows the ship to crack the space-time fabric. The power created by this crystal projects a cloaking field that covers the vessel and renders nearby Protoss forces and vehicles invisible. Offensively, the ship is a devastating force, using its purifier beam to destroy entire enemy squadrons and planets. Motherships can also enter planetary atmospheres using inertial nullifiers allowing the ships to take part in surface battles and anchor the entire Protoss force in combat. Of course, we cannot talk about Protoss ships without discussing our next advantage, the incomparable Spear of Adun. The Spear of Adun is an arc ship, a massive Protoss warship constructed at the height of the Protoss Empire. First, this ship dwarfs many of the largest ships across major science fiction franchises. It comes in at 74 kilometers long and 17 kilometers across. Designed to preserve Protoss society and culture in times of great need, the ship can carry an entire Protoss civilization. It can carry multiple armies of Protoss warriors, fleets of carriers and motherships in its hangars, massive ships in their own right, and can sustain itself for generations. Listen, I can't go into every feature of the Spear of Adun here. That would take a whole video in itself. That said, the ship is loaded with goodies. While an ancient construction, its technology is still advanced by current Protoss standards. Its armament is such that it can wage war single-handedly. It features a wide array of powerful weapons and abilities, such as a harvesting beam, thermal lances, time bombs, purifier beams, solar lances, time stop, and so on. The ship can also provide full energy support to surface troops, meaning that it's somewhat of a failsafe in the case that psionic matrices fail. The ship also features a star forge in its lower decks, which in essence is a mobile war factory producing combat weapons on the go. The next advantage to discuss is technological development. The Protoss might be the most technologically advanced race in the entire universe, though it's not quite fair to call their innovations pure technology because almost everything in their arsenal is powered in part by psionic energy, and thus, through telepathic energy and the Kala, their system of belief, they are actually spiritually and cognitively bonded with their machines. We are going through specific examples of their technology in this video, so why make tech its own advantage? Well, because of the grasp that the Protoss have over their technology. The humans in the 40k universe have awesome tech. The only problem is that no one understands it, including the people in charge of it. The Protoss are wiser than this, however, as they limit their technology at a fear of their inventions evolving faster than they can understand and control them. Instead, the Protoss are restrained with their innovations and have developed a slow and steady system of technological development that they have carried out over thousands of years. Next up, we have warp travel. As the Protoss have been developing their technology through the ages, as you might expect, they have mastered warp travel and the complexities of time and space. I'd like to be able to rag on them more because they're aliens, but I don't know how to use a toaster. 
There's no traveling through hell required for the Protoss to traverse the galaxy. The Protoss are much ahead of their Terran counterparts in this regard. They can very easily and seamlessly enter warp space and exit it very close to celestial bodies, meaning shorter travel times to their destinations. The Protoss can also open warp space rifts on the surface of a planet using warp beacons, meaning that they can warp ships, structures, and infantry right onto and off of the battlefield. There's no need for conventional atmospheric exit plans in the case of the Protoss. The next advantage is that the Protoss are adaptable. Harsh conditions and climates can't stifle the resilient Protoss. They're built tough like Fords, but unlike the automotive company, they're not complete sh**. The Protoss are built to survive in almost any environment. They are strong and fast and are outfitted with sharp claws for more primal engagements. Yes, Protoss derive sustenance from light, but they can go without light for extended periods of time. They need little water and what they do need can be absorbed right through their skin. And even without light and water, they can still survive. When the Dark Templar lived on Shakuras, a lightless planet, they did what any highly intelligent alien race slash baseball player would do. They modified themselves biologically. The Protoss are elite physical specimens. This brings us to our next advantage. The Protoss are highly intelligent mind readers. The Protoss are of unrivaled intelligence and are able to simultaneously process multiple channels of thought and memory in an instant. While Jim Raynor's superpower is an unlimited capacity to process beer in his stomach, the Protoss can think far ahead of their enemies in battle. And they also have psionic powers, meaning they can read minds but they can also use their psionic abilities to charge their weapons, shield themselves, and manipulate matter. Naturally, our next advantage is communication. Protoss communication is pretty straightforward and efficient. When it comes to close range communication, Protoss have the advantage of being psionically connected to each other and can speak telepathically, thus remaining silent to the observer or enemy. Protoss can even sense each other's emotions using their psionic appendages. There is a range limit to their telepathic abilities though. But the Protoss have invented psychic boosters, which you can think of as Wi-Fi extenders, that are used for ship-wide broadcasts. And then they use Psylink spires for communication across interstellar distances. And when it comes to cross-species communication, the Protoss can use their telepathic powers to directly connect to and interface with Terran communication systems. The Protoss have no need for fancy video conference apps. In the future, Google's only consumer is the Zerg, who continually get demonetized for making YouTube videos criticizing Terran colonialism. The next advantage is the Void Ray. The Void Ray is a Dark Templar escort ship, a novel endeavor created through the combination of Nerezim and Kalai technologies. The Void Ray is constructed around a prismatic core, a synthetic crystal that serves as an eternal power source that draws its energy from both the Void and Kala, the faith of the Protoss. Thus, the ship is self-sustaining. The ship is also equipped with flux field projectors. With the Void Ray aiming at a target and the flux projectors deployed, it can shoot a powerful prismatic beam of energy out, capable of decimating heavily armored structures and massive warships. Though only 600 meters in length, the efficiency of the Void Ray has positioned it to replace the carrier as the flagship of the Great Fleet. The next advantage is armor. The Protoss have a few different types of armor but zealots, the backbone of the Protoss military, wear powered suits. Along with being exceptionally reinforced, powered suits are outfitted with a plasma shield generator, a vital signs monitor, navigation tools, compression technology, and a respirator. The suit also enhances its wearer's psionic powers. That in itself makes the suit fairly strong. But unique to the Protoss power armor are psionically calibrated warp stones set on the armor's surface. When the Protoss wearing the suit nears death, these crystal matrices have the power to teleport the ailing Protoss to safety, where of course, if the Protoss is gravely injured but wishes to return to the fight, he can be placed in the shell of a dragoon and sent back into battle. But I digress, the ability to teleport away from danger makes the already thousand year natural life expectancy Protoss even harder to get rid of. And finally, our last advantage is the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a Protoss superiority starfighter. 
The ship isn't perfect, but what makes it truly special is its speed and maneuverability. It can evade and outmaneuver almost any of its enemies. Phoenixes are so capable that they are frequently entrusted with holding back enemies that outnumber them. They are often deployed to the outer rim of Protoss territory, where they survey deep space for alien threats. Armed with ion cannons, the Phoenix is offensively capable, incinerating targets with its energy beams. The cannons are a good fit for allowing the agile Phoenix to fire while moving around at speed. But the beams do have a wavelength limit, and so close quarters combat against more lightly armored enemies is where it's most effective. That said, when under threat from powerful enemies, by overloading the ship's warp field, Phoenix pilots can unleash a gravity beam which immobilizes targets for a few seconds. The diversion of power necessary for the beam used to reduce the Phoenix mobility and strike capability as well. But technological improvements in the year 2506 improved the power management systems of the Phoenix, allowing the craft to use the beam to hit multiple targets and without diverting power from its weapon or propulsion systems. And thus, the Phoenix makes our list. Number one, no cloaking devices. Cloaking devices were common on both Klingon and Romulan vessels, the Federation's two traditional enemies. The Federation had obtained a Romulan cloaking device in the year 2268 by sending the Enterprise to steal one from the Romulans. They installed the device on the Enterprise which enabled it to cloak. They obtained another one in 2286 from the HMS Bounty, a Klingon vessel stolen by Kirk and his crew. They could have easily reverse engineered these cloaking devices and produced them on a mass scale. But in the year 2311, the Federation signed the Treaty of Algeron with the Romulan Star Empire. It defined the neutral zone between the two powers that each side was forbidden to cross, thus stopped confrontation between them. But it forbid the Federation from developing cloaking technology for their starships, whilst the Romulans still could. So the Federation lost out in a big way in order to maintain the status quo. Sounds like some other one-sided deals I can think of. It is clear that the House does not support this deal, but tonight's vote tells us nothing about what it does support. Nothing about how... Let's not go there. Now, because of that treaty, the Federation didn't develop cloaking technology on starships. Doesn't mean they didn't try. Some factions within Starfleet Intelligence did develop a cloaking device that enabled ships not to just be invisible, but to travel through matter such as asteroids and planets as well. It would have made Starfleet ships almost invincible. But as soon as the device was discovered by the crew of the Enterprise D, who used it to escape being trapped in an asteroid, they owned up to the Romulans and vowed not to break the treaty again. They could literally have just flown past the Romulan warbird and continued to develop the technology in secret, but they chose to own up about it instead. There was, however, one Starfleet ship that legitimately had a cloaking device, and that was the USS Defiant. That cloaking device was on loan from the Romulans, and officially could only be used in the Gamma Quadrant. With cloaking technology, think how much more effective Starfleet could have been against the Borg. Voyager could have traveled back through the Delta Quadrant cloaked, avoiding most of the confrontations, and the Enterprise E would have fared a lot better against the Scimitar. But Starfleet and the Federation was too much of a goody two-shoes organization and didn't want to break the rules. Number two, not many dedicated warships. For all of the Next Generation era, and certainly the first half of the Deep Space Nine era, Starfleet lacked any dedicated warships. Ships such as the Enterprise-D were more like luxury cruise liners in space. Look, they even had a yoga studio. It's ridiculous and wonderful. And a bar that hosted a weekly wrestling event. But all that tomfoolery made them unprepared for a serious encounter with a hostile alien force. At the Battle of Wolf 359, they lost 39 ships against a single Borg cube. And at the Battle of Sector 001, they didn't fare that much better, losing at least 20. Starfleet did eventually realize their stupidity and start building some dedicated warships such as the Defiant class and later the Prometheus class. 
which was able to defeat a Romulan Dideridex class warbird with little effort by utilizing its multi-vector attack mode where the ship split into three pieces. But if these ships had been introduced earlier, think how many lives could have been saved in the wars with the Borg and the Dominion. Number 3. Section 31. An Out of Control Intelligence Agency Starfleet had a super secret autonomous special operations agency known as Section 31. They were somewhat akin to the CIA if you believe all the conspiracy theories about that organization. They wore black com badges. And officially they weren't part of Starfleet. You don't sound like Starfleet. Because I'm not Starfleet. We are far more resourceful. That's how we found you. And don't worry. We know how to keep a secret. Even though they were created by Starfleet originally, but they could break all of Starfleet's rules. Flox was kidnapped. Starfleet would never authorize that. Reread the charter, Article 14, Section 31. There are a few lines that make allowances for bending the rules during times of extraordinary threat. In the early days of the NX-01 Enterprise, Malcolm Reed was contracted by Section 31 and for a period of time worked against Captain Archer's orders. In the Kelvin timeline, Section 31 worked with genetically engineered humans to secretly design and build a Dreadnought-class starship and then tried to cover their tracks by killing the Enterprise crew who discovered the plot. That ended up with Section 31's ship, the USS Vengeance, crashing into Starfleet's own headquarters in San Francisco. In the Dominion War, Section 31 developed a biological weapon in the form of a virus which infected the Founders. Luckily, Odo passed on the cure to his people, saving them from extinction. Section 31 weren't accountable to anyone. They had no known physical headquarters, and for them, the end would justify the means. Put simply, they could kill whoever they wanted to if they thought that it was for the benefit of the Federation. But this all created internal conflicts with other officers and just led to instability and death. Number 4. The Prime Directive the Prime Directive, also known as General Order 1, was Starfleet's non-interference rule. Whilst being quite complicated with 47 sub-orders in general, it prohibited Starfleet from interfering in the internal affairs of alien cultures and also prohibited them from revealing themselves to pre-warp civilizations. But this rule, whilst being logical for the most part, sometimes stopped the Federation from mounting rescue missions to save their own people like the Time Wharf is aboard a Klingon ship that is attacked by a rival faction in the Klingon Civil War. Or the recent, warning, I'm going to talk about Star Trek Discovery. The recent episode of Star Trek Discovery in which Captain Pike decides not to take a breakaway human civilization of 11,000 people in the Beta Quadrant back to Earth because they are still at the level of pre-warp civilization. Even though one guy in the group is really clued in about what's going on, has already guessed that they have a starship and seems totally up for being rescued. The rule also sometimes caused Starfleet crews to place themselves in danger in order to avoid revealing themselves to less developed civilizations. Did the indigenous life forms see you? No, Mr. Spock, they did not. The Prime Directive clearly states there can be no interference with the internal development of alien civilization. I know what it says, which is why I'm running through the jungle wearing a disguise. Although it didn't really go as planned in that particular instance. Basically, the Prime Directive is a nuisance, and it's always something they end up messing up anyway. Who are they? Number 5. The Earth is often left defenseless. Which modern military doesn't put its most advanced weapons and ships in position to defend its home territory? The US has military bases all over the country, so does the UK. When Russian bombers fly close to UK airspace, Eurofighter Typhoon aircraft can be mobilized within minutes to intercept. But in Starfleet, they often leave the Earth defenseless. There seems to be no home fleet to protect the planet, and this massive thing in orbit was unarmed. Can you believe that? Although it did have 40 weapon mounts on which phasers could be installed and could be ready for battle within, wait for it, a week. The Borg aren't going to wait for a week for you to be ready for battle. On two occasions, Borg cubes were able to breach the so-called Mars defense perimeter, which really didn't offer much defense at all. Look, there it is. 
gone. And they managed to fly right up to Earth orbit. On the first occasion, the Enterprise D was the only ship that could get to Earth to stop them. On the second occasion, Starfleet were a bit better prepared with a fleet of maybe 30 ships as a last line of defense for Earth. Number six, lack of industrial capacity. While other space navies were able to build battle stations the size of small moons 160 kilometers across, the biggest thing Starfleet was able to build was this Starfleet 74, which was apparently 13 kilometers in height. The Galactic Empire in Star Wars had 25,000 Star Destroyers. That's 25,000 of just one class of ship. But Starfleet was nowhere near that formidable. Some nerds online do estimate that there were probably about 25,000 vessels in Starfleet's fleet, but that includes runabouts, which are about the size of a Winnebago, as well as small fighters. So the actual number of capital ships would have been probably closer to 10,000 and many of them were older Miranda, Excelsior, and Nebula-class vessels. Starfleet's smaller size compared to the Galactic Empire in Star Wars or other space navies in Star Trek were due to their ethics, the fact that they didn't use slave labor. The Death Star was built with the labor of Wookiee slaves. The Romulans used slave labor of the Remans, their neighboring planet, to build their massive fleet, and the Borg, of course, kidnapped the populations of entire planets and turned them into drones to carry out construction of huge cubes and all of the operations of their fleet. So Starfleet had moral high ground, but they also got totally destroyed in battles several times. Number seven, they mixed their civilian population with the military. For a long time, Starfleet didn't build warships, which meant that those luxury cruise liner type ships with yoga studios had to double as warships when the time came. But these ships carried the crew's family members, including wives, children, and even pets. Will you take care of Spot for me? Your animal. During the Battle of Wolf 359, Commander Sisko's wife and son were both aboard his ship, the USS Saratoga, when it engaged a Borg cube. The ship was an older Miranda-class vessel and was easily disabled and then completely destroyed by the Borg. The Borg assault blew up Sisko's quarters where his son Jake and his wife Jennifer were. Sisko managed to save his son, but his wife had already died from the blast. He was forced to take his son to an escape pod and eject, leaving his wife's body on board to be destroyed when the ship blew up. The event, of course, brought serious emotional damage to Sisko, but could have easily been avoided if Starfleet had just been a bit more realistic about the dangers of living on a starship that could be called to fight off alien cyborgs at a moment's notice. Basically, family members of the officers should have stayed at home. Number eight, questionable human resources practices. In Star Trek, it often seems like everyone above the rank of captain is a total douchebag. Just like Admiral Doherty in Star Trek Insurrection, who orders the relocation of an entire civilization. And it will destroy the Baku. Just as cultures have been destroyed in every other forced relocation throughout history. Jean-Luc, we're only moving 600 people. How many people does it take, Admiral, before it becomes wrong? Hmm? Or Admiral Marcus in the Kelvin timeline, who conspires with Section 31 and almost kills the entire Enterprise crew. Leaving me no choice but to hunt you down and destroy you. Lock phasers. Wait, sir, wait, 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 wait! I'll make this quick. Target all aft torpedoes on the Enterprise bridge. There were also some questionable promotions of junior officers. Nog of Ferengi reached the rank of Ensign after just two years as a cadet at Starfleet Academy. He was the only Ferengi in Starfleet, so perhaps this is what they call affirmative action. Then there was Wesley Crusher, who was made an acting Ensign before he'd even taken the Starfleet Academy entrance exam. Picard later promoted him to being a full Ensign before he had attended the Academy as a cadet. He was brilliant, but he also almost destroyed the ship on several occasions. But his mom was best friends with the captain, so well, hey. Number nine, life expectancy of junior officers is very short. Well, this may be cliche, but junior officers always die. In the original series, they wore red shirts. They would do. 
and in later series they wore yellow shirts. But basically the rule is, whenever they introduce a new crew member in addition to the main cast, it's basically because they're gonna die. Like Lieutenant Hawk in Star Trek First Contact. We have an invisible range. Abort Guess what? He dies! Hawk! I'm guessing this crew members just lacked the appropriate training, or perhaps were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, but actually I think it's more like a storytelling element. They can't kill off the main characters, but they want to know the situation is dangerous by having a few people die. Number 10. They were kind of racist, or speciesist. For an organization that was in theory open for any member species of the Federation to join, and even non-member species could join actually if they got a letter of recommendation from a Starfleet officer, there sure were a lot of humans serving on these ships and not many aliens. The Enterprise D only had Worf on the bridge who was fully non-human, Troy was half Betazoid and Data was an android made to look exactly like a human, almost. The only non-human bridge officer on Voyager was Tuvok, same with the NX-01 Enterprise. It seems the Vulcans folded their fleet into Starfleet after the Federation was formed since we never see any Vulcan ships in the Prime Timeline series except for Enterprise which was mostly before the forming of the Federation. So you'd expect to see more Vulcan officers but actually you never do except for this Vulcan captain on Benjamin Sisko's ship. So maybe they're just racist, or maybe there are actually other Federation ships with completely Vulcan crews. Vulcans do say that they hate the smell of humans, so it's like they practice segregation perhaps. Anyway, humanity first, so I think I'm with the Federation on this. Screw aliens, screw dolphins. Number one, Starship Design. For a long period of time, Starfleet didn't build warships, but after their horrifying defeat at the Battle of Wolf 359, they were forced to rethink their strategy, and eventually when they did reluctantly decide to build some dedicated battleships, they produced some really incredible vessels. The USS Defiant is a great example of this. The vessel was more compact than other Starfleet ships, and was equipped with pulse phaser cannons, photon and quantum torpedo launchers, and ablative armor which would protect the ship when shields failed. When weapons fire hit the armored hull, the armor would burn off at a controlled rate, diffusing the energy of the blast. This controlled boil-off would create a particle cloud that would diffuse weapons fire, kind of like a 24th century version of chaff that's used by fighter jets to evade guided missiles. Then there was the Enterprise E, a redesigned version of the Enterprise D, but with much heavier armament, suited for more tactical roles such as fighting the Borg. The Enterprise E was also able to punch above its weight in its battle with the Scimitar, a ship with 52 pulse disruptor cannons and 27 photon torpedo launchers. Even if they did use some unconventional tactics. Put simply, when they finally got their act together, Starfleet's vessels outclassed those of its rivals. Number 2. The ability to amass large fleets for battle. Starfleet wasn't as big as other space navies. Like we said in our previous video, their reluctance to use slave labor limited their industrial capacity, but they were able to amass large fleets for battle. At Wolf 359, they faced the Borg with 40 ships. At the Battle of Sector 001, a similar number. But in the Dominion War, Starfleet really pulled its resources together and amassed a fleet of 627 ships to take on the Dominion and the Cardassians in Operation Return, the effort to retake Deep Space Nine and control of the Bajoran wormhole. You see multiple Galaxy-class ships fighting together and other older-style vessels. So even at this time when they hadn't yet built a lot of dedicated battleships, they still packed a punch. Number 3. Soft Power Starfleet served the United Federation of Planets, and from the start, the Federation were diplomats. The Federation was an alliance formed in 2161 between humans, Vulcans, Andorians, and Tellarites. To be honest, I could cope with the two on the right, but that one on the left, I don't think I'd even want to be in the same room as that. 
I'm speciesist, I know. Anyway, the Federation didn't rely on military conquest to expand, like the Klingons did. Instead, they relied on diplomacy, peacefully recruiting member worlds. By the latter half of the 24th century, the Federation had over 150 member planets. So kind of like the European Union, which has just peacefully expanded by recruiting new members ever since its creation, with one exception. Let's not go there. And it isn't just member worlds that the Federation would use its diplomacy on. They were also very eager to negotiate with enemies. They ended their war with the Klingons with a treaty known as the Kittimer Accords and maintained peace with the Romulan Star Empire with another treaty known as the Treaty of Aldron, which set out the neutral zone between Federation and Romulan space. They were even open to fighting alongside their traditional enemies in order to defeat threats from elsewhere in the galaxy. Both the Romulans and Klingons fought alongside Starfleet ships in the war with the Dominion, and the Enterprise E also fought alongside two Romulan ships to defeat the Scimitar, which was under the command of the illegitimate Romulan leader Shinzon. Number 4. Intelligence and Ingenuity Humans are smart and possess a unique way of looking at problems compared to other alien races, some of which are very predictable. Vulcans always use logic, for example. This is one reason why the Borg were so eager to assimilate Earth, the unique human characteristics. You are not Borg. That's right. And I hope to stay that way. You will be assimilated. Humans were often able to think on their feet and come up with ingenious solutions to problems, outwitting their enemies. Like the time the crew of Voyager were able to modify Borg nanoprobes to create a weapon that could take on the seemingly invincible Species 8472, which even the Borg couldn't defeat. Or how Janeway ultimately defeated the Borg when she infected them with a computer virus after being assimilated. Number 5. Incredible Adaptability Humans are adaptable. A largely human crew was able to man and operate the former Cardassian space station Terrap Nor, which they renamed Deep Space Nine. The Voyager crew were able to adapt to life 70,000 light years away from Federation space in the Delta Quadrant, whilst maintaining Starfleet protocol and even use Borg technology to modify their ship. They built an astrometrics lab, enhanced the sensors, and hooked up a Borg transwarp coil to their warp drive system, which took 15 years off their trip home. Number six, they had the ability to time travel. So when all other options fail, why not just time travel and solve the problem before it happens? So Starfleet were able to time travel, but they didn't use it all the time. They reserved it for when they were really screwed. Like the time an alien probe that only spoke whale language started destroying the Earth and they decided to go back in time in a stolen Klingon bird of prey to collect some whales to communicate with it. Then there was that time when the Enterprise E followed the Borg back in time to foil their assassination attempt of Zephram Cochran, pig trainer and the inventor of warp drive. And it seems that Starfleet took damage to the timeline very seriously. By the 29th century, they would have dedicated timeships like the Starfleet timeship Relativity, which specialized in policing illegal time travel and repairing damage that illicit time travelers did to the timeline. And she interacted with her past self in front of 15 crew members at a ping pong tournament approximately six minutes ago. Your time frame, of course. Of course. Needless to say, we need to clean up the timeline. Number seven, the ability to rise from the ashes. When Starfleet lost control of Deep Space Nine and were pushed back into the inner area of Federation territory by the Dominion, they were really close to being completely annihilated. And if Dominion reinforcements had come through the wormhole, they would have been toast. But Benjamin Sisko persuaded the Admiralty to allow one last battle with everything they had available in order to retake Deep Space Nine and stop the Dominion reinforcements from coming through the wormhole. And they were successful thanks to the Klingons joining the battle at the final hour and they were able to stop the Federation from being completely eliminated. Number 8. They were incredible at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yes, Starfleet personnel always seem to have the upper hand against aliens, even when they're fighting in slow motion. Yes. 
well, maybe that was a special case, but we do often see Starfleet officers beating the hell out of Klingons, who were supposed to be a warrior race far more formidable than pathetic humans. Yet the Klingons lose every time, even to smaller female members of the crew like Major Kira. Major Kira may have been in the Bajoran militia, but she was no Ronda Rousey. How much time? Three seconds. Oh, Maybe it's that powerful backhand that everyone in Star Trek seems to use. The only exception is Worf, who just always seems to get beaten up. And he's a Klingon, after all, so it makes sense. I guess they were just a bunch of pussies. Anyway, number nine, they weren't afraid to sacrifice. We often see Star Trek officers sacrifice themselves for the good of the Federation, or even the good of other innocent alien races. This ranges from risking their careers, like when the Enterprise E crew disobeyed a direct order so they can go assist Starfleet to defend the Earth from the Borg, or like when Kirk went to work on the deflector relays in order to break the Enterprise B free from an energy ribbon, saving the entire crew and refugees who were on board, but dying himself in the process. I think this attitude of Starfleet officers is summed up in the words of Spock. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And that takes us nicely into our 10th and final advantage of Starfleet. Number 10, they had the moral high ground. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. Not that kind of high ground. The Federation was very strong on human rights. Starfleet officers couldn't just go and rape and pillage lesser developed civilizations. In fact, the Prime Directive forbade them from even revealing themselves to pre-warp societies. Citizens of the Federation also enjoyed, in general, excellent human rights. Even non-biological species, such as androids, were given these freedoms. It is the ruling of this court that Lieutenant Commander Data has the freedom to choose. Yep, Data was pro-choice, he had an abortion. No, I'm just kidding. I support the unborn. But there was no one more passionate about human rights and freedom of speech than Picard. Check this out. The first time any man's freedom is trodden on, we're all damaged. The first flaw to discuss is science. Now this is a short one, but it's important to mention because it sets the stage for all of the other flaws. On one hand, Halo has a very comprehensive lore, and so because there is so much information on the UNSC Navy available, as in 40K, more flaws are discernible. But even beyond that, in the Halo universe, the UNSC Navy suffers from science. You see, more than just about any Navy we have covered in this series so far, Halo tries very hard to have all of the UNSC's weapons and technology abide by the physical laws of the universe as much as reasonably possible. It's easy to tell that Halo's creators put in strenuous effort to make things make sense, and while that is very commendable, it also means that UNSC technology is going to have some very real flaws, and that there is clearly a very human trial and error-like evolution of their innovations. And so we will see moving forward that their flaws will be more practical than we've previously seen. We're not going to have hell demons popping out of warp realms to corrupt the mind of man. Instead, we are going to have some shoddy technology. The next flaw to discuss is the magnetic accelerator cannon, the large coil gun that serves as the primary offensive weapon on UNSC warships and orbital platforms. Now, the various different types of the gun are capable of delivering an extremely powerful blast, akin to that of a nuclear weapon, and without the risk of radiological fallout. And if any of you comment on my use of the word nuclear, nuclear, I swear, I'm gonna give you so much money, God damn it, I suck at dissing. 
But I digress, whether firing uranium cores or tungsten rounds, the MAC gun is a massively deadly weapon. So what's the issue? Well, the MAC has a lot of trouble destroying Covenant warships. Yes, the MAC cannon can indeed destroy the Covenant's energy shields, but it often takes multiple hits to do so. Not a quality one would want of their primary offensive weapon, especially when UNSC defenses aren't all that great. There have even been instances when Covenant ships have withstood hits from the MAC with their shields down. It's true that Super MAC cannons on orbital platforms, supercarriers, and the Infinity are much stronger, but not having those guns mounted on ships throughout their fleet is a huge disadvantage. The next flaw is orbital defense platforms. ODPs are large UNSC space stations built to defend important assets and locations. As we already spoke about, ODPs are very offensively capable as they are armed with super MAC cannons that can obliterate Covenant capital ships with a single shot. No doubt they provide solid protection to UNSC planets. However, there's one big issue. ODPs don't keep their power supply on board, as the generators would take up too much space on the platform and would be targets for Covenant Navy ships. Instead, the power supply is kept on the ground, which allows for bigger generators and more efficient power generation. Again, this is great for the ODP's offensive capabilities. The problem is that Covenant ground forces can easily target and take out these generators, thereby disabling entire platforms. And this is exactly what happened during the Battle of Reach. I don't know that the generators would be safer on the heavily defended platforms, but it seems that the UNSC needs to figure out a better way of defending these space stations that serve as an integral line of defense against Covenant invasion of important planets. The next flaw is artificial intelligence. In the Halo universe, humanity employs smart AI and roles throughout the UNSC. Smart AI are able to self-learn and be insightful as their intelligence is based off of the human brain. They execute various operations aboard Navy starships, such as controlling weapons and defense systems. However, the AI that humans have developed is very limited due to rampancy, which is the point at which the machines reach the point of being so overloaded with information that no room remains to carry out their tasks or basic functions. That was second grade for me. At this stage, usually seven or so years into an AI robot's life, the AI can go crazy and pose a danger to humans, and so they are typically terminated before they ever pose a threat. A robot experiencing rampancy can begin to think it is superior to humans and desire power. Thus, UNSC AI is liable to rebel and betray humanity. The next flaw is Titanium A armor. Titanium A armor is the primary armor plating protecting UNSC warships. The armor is composed of high-grade Titanium 50 that is alloyed with other elements for further fortification. Titanium A plating would be considered very strong armor. In 2019, even prior to the Human Covenant War, the plating was penetrable by MAC cannon fire. Then, against the Covenant, it has proven highly ineffective. Titanium A armor is supposedly heat resistant, and yet Covenant plasma torpedoes can boil it away in seconds, pulse laser turrets can destroy a Titanium A reinforced hull in one hit, and even energy swords can do damage to the armor. It's not even very protective against collisions with other vessels in space. Titanium A has seen some upgrades over time, but without energy shields, which humans didn't really develop until after the Human Covenant War, the armor plating is of little help in protecting their ships. The next flaw is the Punic class supercarrier. At almost four kilometers long, the Punic class is one of the largest class of warships ever produced by the UNSC. All space navies have proven to need supercarriers in order to transport large forces and smaller aircraft, vehicles, and weapons throughout the galaxy. Oh, what are we kidding? Supercarrier builds are just pissing contests. But it's important to piss the best, my friends. But again, I digress. Supercarriers are important in space navies, and that is no different with the UNSC. And the Punic class played that pivotal role for them. The ship was also well armed, being equipped with two Super Mac cannons, multiple Mini Macs, and missile batteries. The ship was well armored too, just not to fight the Covenant. Like many pre-war UNSC ships, the Punic was protected by Titanium A armor, sands, and energy shield. This became a major problem for the UNSC Navy during the Human Covenant War, as many Punic supercarriers were lost, and losing a supercarrier meant losing thousands of military personnel, and a hugely expensive asset that takes overwhelming resources to produce. By the end of the war, only a few Punic-class supercarriers remained. The next flaw is the Strident-class heavy frigate, or an Italian frigate. 
I wanted this ship to be an advantage. It can serve multiple roles, including as an escort ship for supercarriers, a transport ship for infantry, or as an assault ship for attacks on the Covenant fleet. The 575 meter long ship is also well armed, boasting a Mark IV heavy coil Mac cannon, two M42 Archer missile pods, five Mark 55 Castor naval coil guns, six Mark 57 Arena point defense guns, six M870 Rampart joint defense guns, and three Hyperion nuclear delivery systems. The ship, however, has two major issues. First, they are able to be equipped with energy shields, so they don't just have to rely on their titanium A battle plate armor. And yet many Stridents lack the energy shields due to a shortage of shield emitters, and thus are vulnerable to being lost in battle. Secondly, due to the ship's small size, it is unable to carry an abundance of ammunition despite being armed with many guns. Thus, much of its combat operations have to take place near supply depots thereby limiting the ship's ability to do battle in deep space. The next flaw is the Prowler. The Prowler is a Corvette-class ship used by the UNSC Navy for stealth infiltration and exfiltration, electronic intelligence gathering, and mine laying, which is their only direct combat role. Prowlers are able to stay hidden using a variety of low-profile sensor systems and stealth systems that mask the ship from visual and sensor detection. Anyway, it's great that the UNSC Navy has a fleet of ships dedicated to intelligence gathering, whereas many space navies neglect intelligence operations altogether. But if the Prowler is the best that the UNSC has to offer, then their intelligence fleet has a lot of issues. While Prowlers can stay in stealth mode for weeks, they aren't completely undetectable. After only 15 minutes in combat, the ability of Covenant sensors to detect Prowlers increases exponentially. Secondly, while Prowler pilots are well trained in stealth maneuvers, the ship itself forces its operator to trade speed for stealth. The more engine power used, the less stealth capable the Prowler is. Additionally, the inability of the Prowler to sufficiently hide itself from Covenant detection might not be such an egregious flaw if the Prowler could reasonably defend itself, but it can't, as the ship is lightly armed and armored. The limited stealth capabilities of the Prowler really handcuffed the Navy's intelligence gathering abilities, especially in the face of far superior Covenant camouflage technology. That said, humans have been able to improve the Prowler a bit over time by copying from Covenant tech. The next flaw is faster than light travel. In the Halo universe, slipstream space is the medium used for FTL travel. Slipstream space or slip space is a hyper-compressed multidimensional space separate from real space. The UNSC Shaw Fujikawa Translate engine allows humans to travel through slip space. The engine rips apart normal space-time by using high-power cyclic particle accelerators to generate microscopic black holes. While the UNSC has clearly achieved faster than life travel with the aforementioned technology, they have far from mastered it. First, for the most part, only ships with large mass have the ability of FTL travel, as their gravity wells are able to stabilize slip space enough for safe travel. Smaller naval ships could potentially break apart in slip space. Secondly, a slip space drive's magnetic coil could drift out of phase when entering and leaving slip space, which means they require constant maintenance and repair. Sometimes such repair is needed during the course of travel and could result in casualties to technicians. Every 40K fan right now is like, so? Even worse, slip space drives are vulnerable to complete mechanical failure, which could doom a ship in slip space. Third, slip space travel isn't akin to real space travel in terms of the relationship between distance and velocity. Journeys through slip space are often affected by currents and other temporal variations. Therefore, travel times, even along previously traveled routes, cannot be known for sure. For humans, a good part of FTL travel can be somewhat unpredictable. Perhaps worst of all, as is the case with much of their technology, the UNSC Navy's FTL travel capabilities pale in comparison to that of Covenant technology. The last flaw to discuss is communication. The UNSC Navy has no real form of real-time interstellar communication. When it comes to long-distance communication, they really only have two options. They have the Slip Space Comm Launcher. The system works by launching a communications probe through a slip space rift. It then travels at FTL speed to its preset destination, where it enters back into normal space and delivers the message. Comm launchers are extremely expensive, and so few have ever been built. The other option is the Slipstream Packet Generator. This system works by sending a burst radio transmission through slip space instead of a probe. The messages have to be fairly short given the power required to keep the slip space rift open and have a maximum range of 15 light years, but at that range they are close to instantaneous. These messages are also liable to interception by Covenant forces, so they are often heavily encrypted. 
In any case, no real perfect form of real-time superluminal communication has been developed yet by the UNSC Navy, a severe disadvantage. That said, as humans learn more and more from Covenant and Forerunner technology, their intergalactic communication gets better and better. The first advantage is the UNSC Infinity, an experimental Infinity-class supercarrier commissioned into the Navy following the Human Covenant War. The Infinity is one of the largest and most versatile ships the UNSC employs. Constructed using Forerunner and Covenant technology recovered by humans, the ship helps to level the playing field for the UNSC in their fight against them bastard aliens. The over 18,000 foot long ship has a hull composed of the more advanced titanium A3 armor and is the first known ship to be equipped with energy shields, an essential addition to the UNSC Navy given titanium A armor's inability to stop Covenant weapons from penetrating their vessels. That sounded kind of weird. The ship contains hundreds of bays allowing for mass deployment of thousands of smaller ships, escape vehicles, and space pods. The ship is also massively armed, boasting super Mac cannons, a complex missile network for various modes of offensive and defensive combat, and nuclear warheads. Nuclear. Nuclear warheads. Nuclear. The next advantage is naval personnel. Not only does the UNSC have a long history of badass commanding officers, but general service people, officers, and enlisted men are also very capable. All naval personnel are adept at self-defense and firearms. The Navy runs multiple elite academies where recruits go through a basic boot camp in which they are trained, tested, and evaluated. Some recruits complete additional space training as well. Whereas unskilled workers fill up the ships in many space navies, UNSC vessels are populated by well-trained soldiers, marines, and even Spartans. Certainly the average crew member on a UNSC Navy vessel is far more capable than the average crew member on a 40k Navy ship. But I suppose that capability doesn't really matter when the object is to die in the latter case. After personnel, the next advantage is organizational structure. The UNSC Navy doesn't just have a linear hierarchy going from top to bottom. The Navy is structured to assign different tasks to specialized departments. At the top is UNSC Naval Command, or NAVCOM. NAVCOM is then split into three commands. Fleet Command, which oversees mission structure, ship deployment, and space operations such as troop transport. Logistical Operations Command, which oversees construction, maintenance, and distribution of supplies and parts, and Naval Special Warfare Command, which oversees special operations, including Spartan II deployment. These commands then work in conjunction with UNSC Central Command, which oversees specific areas of space which the Navy has to operate in. Lastly, there's the Office of Naval Intelligence, which is officially subordinate to Naval Command, but at the same time often works directly with UNSC entities superior to NAVCOM. The combination of horizontal and vertical divisions of power in the Navy creates a balance of power that keeps it in check, and the division of tasks to specialized commands ensures that the Navy is operating in an efficient manner. Of course, the next advantage is the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, of which many of you issued me death threats on behalf of after the flaws video. As I just alluded to, ONI is officially the intelligence gathering service of the UNSC Naval Command, but its scope of responsibilities extends well beyond that. Whereas many space navies neglect intelligence altogether, the Office of Naval Intelligence is a powerful and dynamic agency that plays a significant role across all UNSC operations. They are able to maintain a tight grip over all communication across United Earth government territories and employ citizens throughout the UEG in shadow work. They also engage in counter-espionage, propaganda, and top-secret research and development programs like the Spartan Program and Project Mjolnir. They are very much the NSA, CIA, KGB, and former East German government baked into one. ONI also has a large amount of military equipment for an intelligence agency. There's the Prowler fleet, which we criticized in the last video, they have a stealth cruiser, and of course ONI exerts significant influence over the UNSC Infinity. The next advantage is energy shielding. 
After experiencing heavy casualties and losing many ships during the Human Covenant War, thanks to inferior armoring, the UNSC needed to develop a way for their ships to absorb Covenant plasma without sustaining serious damage. The answer came in the form of reverse engineering, Kidyar technology to create energy shielding. Throughout the UNSC Navy, energy shielding now provides extra protection to a fleet formerly only fortified by Titanium A armor. Energy shielding can be equipped on ships large or small, and is even used for non-combat reasons, such as separating pressurized areas like hangar bays from the vacuum of space. Energy shielding allows for expensive ships to be more protected from enemy fire, and thus last longer. Of course, when ships don't get destroyed, it also means less casualties and less of an expense of resources to build more ships. Thanks to energy shielding, the Navy is able to focus more on building a lesser amount of more powerful ships, like the Infinity, than on mass producing weaker ships for a war of attrition. The next advantage to talk about is the Halberd class destroyer. At a length of 1,590 feet, the Halberd is a smaller class warship in the UNSC Navy that is designed for offensive capability. The ship has much more mass than other ships of its size thanks to its thicker and higher quality titanium armor, thus allowing it to take a lot of damage. That said, the ship does not have the energy shielding defenses that larger ships do. So why list it as an advantage? Well, its offensive abilities compensate for what it lacks in terms of armoring. Not only is the ship fast, but they are equipped with enhanced weapon systems. They boast a spinal-mounted, twin-linked Mac cannon, 26 oversized M58 Archer missile pods capable of holding over 800 Archer missiles, three Shiva-class nuclear missiles, and four twin-linked M870 Rampart Point defense guns. When using wolf pack tactics, a group of halberds can take out some of the most powerful Covenant warships. The next advantage is the GATL-1 Longsword, the main starfighter employed by the UNSC Navy. The aircraft doubles as both an atmospheric and exoatmospheric fighter and interceptor, but can also be used as an escort or bomber among other roles. The Longsword is replete with advanced technology despite being a small four-person crew aircraft. It can incorporate artificial intelligence and can even be piloted remotely, enabling it for all sorts of more risky missions. Then of course, the longsword is loaded with arms. Standard armament on a GATL-1 is the M9109 50mm machine-linked autocannon, and supplementary weapon systems can include four ASGM-10 missiles, different types of bombs, Murray space mines, and even a Shiva-class nuclear missile, a weapon that is used more conveniently thanks to remote piloting abilities. Perhaps best of all, the longsword is relatively inexpensive to produce, meaning the UNSC Navy is able to deploy the ship in large numbers across their fleet. The next advantage is dropships. The UNSC Navy deploys very capable and versatile dropships, notably the Pelican and Condor. The D-77 TC Pelican and other models of the Pelican are extremely dynamic as far as dropships go. The dropship's main role, as is obvious, is rapid insertion and extraction of troops, vehicles, and equipment from the battlefield. The Pelican is also capable of both atmospheric flight and limited space flight, meaning it can transport troops from orbit to the battlefield. What makes the Pelican unique is that it is a powerful gunship in its own right. The more well-armed variants of the Pelican, such as the G-77S, can be equipped with multiple missile pods, turrets, and autocannons. The D-81 LRT Condor, on the other hand, and its variants lack the armament of the Pelican. However, what makes this ship special is that it contains a slipspace drive, meaning it is capable of faster-than-light travel and can be used to transport smaller crews across the galaxy for various missions. The next advantage is strategy and tactics. If there is an advantage that is derived from the Covenant superior technology, it's that humans have been forced to be innovative in their strategies and planning in order to survive. And this holds true for the UNSC Navy. UNSC legend Admiral Preston Cole used creative slipspace maneuvers during the Battle of Psy Serpentis to lure a Covenant fleet into a massive onslaught of Shiva nuclear missiles, resulting in the destruction of over 300 Covenant ships. Other leaders, like Captain Jacob Keyes and Admiral Carl Patterson, are famous for achieving victories against the Covenant using creative tactics despite being overpowered. The UNSC Navy also has an array of tactical formations they use in their fleet. They have standard and specialist formations for almost every scenario in battle. 
It's hard to talk about specific strategy with the UNSC Navy because there isn't really any consistency over time, which is largely a good thing. They have remained innovative and are constantly changing how they approach space combat, a fact that in no small part has kept the UNSC from annihilation. And finally, our last advantage is the Nova Bomb. Yes, the Covenant has far superior technology than humans, and yet it might be possible that the most powerful weapon in the entire galaxy is wielded by the UNSC. The Nova Bomb is the king of all bombs, a cluster of nine nuclear fusion warheads which can create a blast capable of obliterating a small planet. When the bomb was detonated above Joyous Exultation, a Covenant-governed world, it scorched a quarter of the planet's surface and shattered a nearby moon. When it was detonated on the surface of Glyke, another small Covenant-run world, the blast turned the planet into a vast cloud of debris, killing everything in, on, and around the planet instantly. Despite the UNSC Navy and larger UNSC's many weaknesses, the Nova Bomb is a very respectable trump card. Now, there are certain people out there who are going to tell you that every culture we encounter should be respected, no matter what their values are, no matter what their beliefs or actions are. Um, I say shenanigans to that. But the Covenant are made up of a variety of different alien species, and they're actually uh, segregated into different castes based on their race. In their case, there are definitely different racial traits between these different aliens. A jackal is most likely going to be smarter than a grunt, uh, just like an elite will be physically less stronger than a brute. And before any of you Covenant sycophants uh, reply that I'm not calling them by their native names, well, I'm a human, so they can all go to hell. Hashtag remember reach. Anyway, what this imposed caste system actually does is significantly decrease the efficiency of the Covenant military and Navy and imposes many strict artificial divisions that puts this otherwise advanced force at a huge disadvantage. So the first problem we have is racial segregation. The Covenant were actually a spacefaring species. They didn't really have a home world. Instead, they had a home station that traveled from one world to another. Now, they were a pretty religious society and they basically absorbed new cultures they encountered and forced them to adopt their religious practices. But instead of uplifting each alien race they encountered, a strict hierarchy was established based on values assigned to them by the prophet race. These weren't really intrinsic values based on the true potential of each one of these alien species. Instead, it was based on prejudice stereotypes and very shallow examinations of these cultures. For instance, you had species like the grunts who were a tier six civilization stuck in the industrial age. When they were encountered by the Covenant, their world was actually on the brink of collapse due to some ecological disasters that they had encountered. The prophets and elites immediately classified them as a slave race, placing them at the bottom of their social hierarchy. They looked at the grunts' diminutive stature and laughable technological abilities, and didn't account for the fact that, as a species, they were far younger than the prophets and elites, and weren't necessarily inferior, but just didn't have enough time as a society to develop and advance to the level that they were at. As a matter of fact, both the prophets and elites advanced technology wasn't due to their own intelligence or ability as species, but because of their interaction with the ancient forerunner races. So by forcing the grunts into slavery, they were actually limiting the potential of an entire race, which actually made a pretty large percentage of their entire society. The natural progression for highly advanced and efficient species is usually never slavery of organic beings, and that's because organic beings are naturally unable to cope with these kind of circumstances. It's far more efficient to use AI tech and machines to replace organic workers. Machines don't have the desires and biological impulses that organics did, and were much better at doing quote-unquote slave work. And because of the suppression, slavery, and mistreatment, the grunts time and time again would rebel against the Covenant, which made them a really big security risk for the entire faction. This was especially a huge problem for the Covenant Navy because almost every ship employed grunts as basic security forces and maintenance crews. So as a Covenant leader, I not only have to worry about enemy forces in a battle, I also have to worry about the fact that my entire crew is made up of individuals who potentially could mutiny because of the mistreatment placed on them by my culture. So it goes without saying, having this caste system significantly decreased the efficiency of the Covenant Navy. The grunts were basically the equivalent of gang press sailors 
those that the Royal British Navy used to use. The first Marines that were employed by the Empire weren't actually trained for storming beaches, but for ship security and preventing armed mutinies on their ship. Also, by creating a caste system, you naturally create barriers for advancement for certain races. For the lower races like the Grunts and Jackals, this created low morale. I mean, why would you risk your life in combat for the Covenant if, in fact, they are oppressing your entire race? As we've seen in our own history, typically free men make far more effective combatants than conscript forces that were deployed by dictators. Military is made up of volunteers, and free men typically have less to worry about when it comes to desertion and morale issues. While conscript armies spend a ridiculous amount of energy enforcing discipline and discouraging their soldiers from abandoning their duties. It was this lack of fear of their own soldiers that made free armies much more flexible in the battlefield because you have talented NCOs who had more control in the small unit level. The Covenant just didn't have this ability. The caste system also created natural infighting within the Covenant Navy. This is because it encouraged and exaggerated the differences between the different races to the point where each alien race fought for their own species rather than the Covenant as a whole. In 2,462, decades before the Human and Covenant First Contact War, tensions between the Jackals and Grunts reached an all-time high, so much so that on the Covenant home station of High Charity, the Jackals poisoned a common recreational drug used by the Grunts, which almost sterilized their entire population. In retaliation, their Grunts attacked the Jackals' nests and killed a lot of their eggs. The High Council, made up of elites and prophets, saw this as a minor annoyance and basically ignored this whole situation, which led to further rebellion by the Grunts, who were generally just fed up with the situation. This was especially problematic for the Covenant Navy again because you actually had certain ships that were crewed by just one type of alien. First contact between the human and the Covenant was carried out by a jackal missionary ship which was just like this. So when one alien race mutinies, you're not only worrying about infighting, but you're also worrying about losing a significant portion of your war material. This infighting eventually led to an all-out Covenant civil war known as the Great Schism, and it's not all that surprising. After the Prophet of Regret, one of the leaders of the High Council was killed by Master Chief, the elites assigned to protecting the Prophet was blamed for their lack of ability. And so the Prophet aliens replaced the elites with the more brutal and aggressive Brutes, who had only just recently joined the Covenant. At the same time, the Brutes replaced the elites in high command positions in the Covenant Navy and Army. They basically became field masters and ship masters overnight, which completely screwed up the entire command chain. Oh, and they did this in the middle of a war against the humans. The Covenant naturally underestimated human beings at the time. Our Navy was relatively weak in comparison to theirs. Our ships also lacked shields, we lacked true energy weapons, and used kinetic energy weapons and outdated projectiles. But the Covenant also underestimated humanity's natural ability to survive and also evolve in the face of great strife and adversity. We as a species have made great leaps and bounds in technology when we encountered any threats to our existence. What the Covenant didn't realize was that with each encounter with humanity, with each piece of technology that they lost to us, we were quickly learning and adapting their own technology into our own military force. A great example of this was the energy shield found on the Spartan II armor design. It was clearly reverse engineered from a Jackal's personal shield. While the UNSC Navy advanced in leaps and bounds during the Human Covenant War, the Covenant Navy's technology stagnated. The Covenant clearly underestimated humanity. Their only chance to really defeat us was a quick, swift blow before we were able to adopt their technology. Because at the end of the day, human culture is superior, far superior to the Covenants. By limiting an individual's station in life and ability to advance, they really made their culture stagnate. The Covenant Navy was full of officers appointed based on their race rather than their ability. While the Grunts were physically quite pathetic, they were actually intelligent species. The notion that they were stupid again was caused by stereotypes and prejudice from the elite class and profit class. After centuries of suppression, it was just expected that the Grunts would be subversive and quiet. But we've seen, as with the case of Grunts like the Deacon Dadab, that Grunts could be quite intelligent when allowed to. The same could be said about the Jackals, who were quite intelligent as well. But by limiting high command positions only to elites and brutes, the Covenant were also imposing limits to their own recruitment pools and overlooking talented Grunts and Jackals. 
Now the covenant government is a theocracy. This means that religion dictated the rules and laws of their governance, and that affected everything in covenant society all the way down to its navy. Now we've already mentioned many times, during the covenant human war, humanity advanced very quickly while the covenant forces basically stagnated. This wasn't just due to infighting in the covenant navy, but because of how their entire society functioned and was structured around the worship of an extinct alien race known as the Forerunners. Most covenant technology was derived from, or as they thought, gifted to them by the Forerunners. By placing this mystical and religious connotation to things like energy shields, plasma cannons, and slipstream generators, it prevents proper scientific research from being conducted on them. As humans find out relatively quickly, their forerunners weren't gods, but a flawed species of aliens, and at a biological level were no more special than the Covenant or the humans. Again, I can't help but draw correlations between the sci-fi universe and our own actual real world. Uh, we've seen time and time again nations that don't have a separation between religion and state have huge societal and economic problems. Countries like Iran, Sudan, Yemen, and Afghanistan all are at a severe disadvantage on a global stage because of this. It's not that religion is bad, or even that it's bad for society. There are many positive things that religion brings along with it. But a theocracy is fundamentally flawed because its basic rules are judged by religion, and religion, you know, at its core is a very abstract idea. Every individual interprets their relationship with religion uh, from different points of view. And then again, you have individuals who aren't re uh, religious at all, and they basically don't fit in your theocratic system in that way. Which is why theocracies are rarely established on a predictable and fair set of rules and laws and usually have oppressive directives aimed to quell dissenters and portions of the population. And that's exactly what the Covenant Theocratic Government does. It places its own people into religious castes. It also limits their technological discoveries and abilities. And it's also started a holy war against humanity, which is never a good idea. And to cap things off, the religion that this theocratic government is based on is completely false and completely misunderstands who the Forerunners actually were. The first two species to encounter the remnants of Forerunner tech in the Covenant were the Prophets and the Elites. The Elites had a more hands-off, don't-touch-it approach while dealing with the Forerunners, while the Prophets incorporated Forerunner tech into their own military, which is why they were able to defeat the Elites when they first contacted them. But again, the Prophets, biologically speaking, didn't possess superior intelligence at all. If anything, they were quite stupid and closed-minded based on their actions. For one, they completely misunderstood the purpose of the Forerunners and the purpose of the Halo Arrays. They thought that the Halo Arrays were the pathway to their salvation, when in fact it was just a gigantic super weapon that was designed to destroy all sentient life in the galaxy in order to prevent the spread of the Flood. This was something that Master Chief and Cortana were able to figure out literally days after first encountering a Halo Ring. This is also why the Prophets saw humanity as such a threat to them. We basically proved that their whole religious society was bogus, and that includes their caste system, which is the only thing really keeping the Prophets in power. The Covenant were really just first adopters of Forerunner technology. Instead of creating value and progress with that technology, they sought to control other beings and suppress other beings in order to protect their own power. This is why the Covenant are evil and their society is completely flawed. The first advantage is the energy projector. Article 8, Clause C of the Humanity First Codebook states, when in doubt, exterminatus. Unfortunately, sometimes aliens can glass entire planets too. Coming in a variety of different types, from excavation beam to plasma lance, energy projectors are exceptionally powerful planet-cracking, capital warship-destroying weapons, even relative to glassing weapons used by other space navies. Energy projectors fire a thin beam of plasma and require a period of time to charge between attacks. Most forms of the weapon the Covenant uses have a huge range, usually somewhere in the realm of 100,000 kilometers, and don't need to be close to a target to exact supreme destruction. Energy projectors are easily able to penetrate the UNSC's Titanium A armor and present a serious challenge to humanity's chances for survival. The next advantage is the CAS-class Assault Carrier, a 17,500-foot-long capital warship. 
The assault carrier is designed for ship-to-ship -ship combat, command and control of fleet operations, and as support ships for ground forces. At over 17,000 feet long, the ship is one of the Covenant's larger ships and is deployed only during the most important operations, such as invasions of important planets. The ship is fortified with nano-laminate plating, armor strong enough to stop many UNSC weapons aside from MAC cannons. More importantly, the ship's energy shields are some of the strongest the Covenant fleet has to offer. The High Prophet of Regret's assault carrier flagship Solemn Penance penetrated Earth's orbital defense despite facing an onslaught of fire from Cairo Station. The assault carrier has special tech called Modular Dispersal Technology, which allows it to detach damaged sections during battle, thus increasing the chances of salvaging the rest of the ship. The ship is also one of the most well-armed in the Covenant fleet, boasting multiple energy projectors and an array of pulse laser turrets and plasma torpedoes. The next advantage is the CSO-class supercarrier, a Covenant capital warship. At 95,000 feet long, only dumb aliens would build such a big ship. The vessel, designed for similar operations as the assault carrier, dwarfs all other Covenant ship classes, and given its prodigious size, is also, like the assault carrier, used only during the most important operations. Of course, put next to the assault carrier, the full extent of the Covenant's creativity is on display. Supercarriers are the Covenant's most powerful vessels. The ship is armed with seven energy projectors, thousands of pulse lasers, turrets, and plasma torpedo launchers. The ship also houses hundreds of smaller ships it can deploy along with entire Covenant armies. The legendary Covenant supercarrier Long Night of Solace played a crucial role in the invasion of Reach, deploying forces, ships, and all sorts of technology from orbit to the surface of the planet. The next advantage is faster than light travel. As we spoke about in our videos on the UNSC, humans in Halo have not mastered FTL travel, but for the most part, the Covenant has. Like the UNSC, the Covenant fleet uses slipspace for superluminal transportation, but does so in a much more sophisticated way, resulting in much faster journeys from point A to B. The Covenant slipspace drive is more reliable than the Shaw Fujikawa Translite engine the UNSC uses allowing Covenant ships to avoid suffering from the temporal fluidity that human vessels do. Covenant ships cut a very fine hole in the fabric of space-time, enter slipspace at a precise point, execute a series of micro-jumps through slipspace, and also exit slipspace at a precise point and time. The Covenant's more advanced technology allows for much faster and more accurate travel times, with their ships able to travel at about 912 light years per day, compared to the UNSC's travel rate of 2.625 light years per day. Additionally, the more precise technology allows the Covenant to avoid human defenses and gain positional advantage. Using quick short slipstream jumps, Covenant ships can even evade missiles which cannot track through slipspace. The next advantage is interstellar communication. While the UNSC has trouble communicating across the vastness of space and utilize very new technology to do so, the Covenant, as with FTL travel, have pretty much mastered it. The Covenant also use slipspace for interstellar communications, but the Covenant have communication relays installed on some of their ships and planets that enable communication across space. This communication system is called the proselytization network which not only allows for superluminal communication, but also for the profits on high charity, the Covenant's now defunct mobile capital city, to stay connected with their armies and ensure their continued obedience. At the Covenant's height, their ships contained an automated messaging system that transmitted orders and messages from ship to ship on arrival or departure from a star system. Due to Covenant arrogance and ignorance of their own technology, these messages are not properly encrypted and are liable to interception but nonetheless, the Covenant is able to rapidly send information across interstellar space. The next advantage is the ORS-class Heavy Cruiser. This capital warship is used for planetary occupations and as support ships for Covenant flagships. Like other ships in the Covenant fleet, it is well-armed and armored. The ship is equipped with three plasma beam emitters, 16 plasma torpedoes, 48 plasma cannons, and two energy projectors capable of blowing up worlds or bisecting UNSC warships. Though I suppose my pet gerbil could bisect a UNSC warship. He is a feral one. 
What makes this ship unique is that it also features stealth technology, making the ship capable of reconnaissance missions despite its length of almost 10,000 feet. The next advantage is the CPV-class Heavy Destroyer. This is of course a destroyer warship, coming in at only 5,460 feet long, and it makes the list because like the ships before it, it still packs a punch despite being downsized. And that's the thing with the Covenant fleet. All of its ships are similar, as we see with the supercarrier and assault carrier. The heavy destroyer is the workhorse offensive ship of the Covenant Navy. But it doesn't just engage in ship-to-ship -ship combat. The destroyer is actually the ship that most often engages in glassing operations given its energy projector and crew of misfits and outcasts that were seen as low enough to undertake such missions. The ship also has two plasma beam emitters, 24 plasma cannons, six torpedoes, 20 pulse laser turrets, and 40 plasma bombardment mortars. Again, all not too unlike other Covenant ships, but packed into a much smaller vessel, affording the Covenant a ship made for heavy combat that they can produce and use frequently. The next advantage is the Covenant Spire, a structure that serves as the base of operations for Covenant forces on the ground. The spires allow soldiers, vehicles, and weapons to be teleported to a planet's surface from Covenant vessels in orbit, eliminating the need for conventional atmospheric entry. Spires are also capable of projecting energy shields over a large radius, thus affording protection to recently teleported forces and to the spire itself. The shields are resistant to conventional weapons and can disable enemy vehicles that pass through them, making spire shield zones hazardous areas for the UNSC on the battlefield. Given that the spires are self-protected and difficult to destroy, they are a critical part of Covenant invasion efforts and a nightmare for UNSC forces to deal with. The next advantage is the DSC-class support ship. Very few support ships in Space Navy history are as important as the Covenant DSC-class one. The ship is fairly well armed with a variety of plasma weaponry, but it largely stays out of combat. The ship instead provides food and supplies to Covenant soldiers. The ship itself actually contains large hunting preserves with many animals that can be killed and served to its tenant fleet. The ship also has assembly forges that manufacture food packs, maintenance kits, clothing, and even small weapons. The ships, at over 5,000 feet long, are gigantic mobile factories that the Covenant can send along with any fleet. The final advantage is High Charity. In effect, High Charity was a massive space station that housed billions of Covenant denizens and functioned not only as the Covenant's capital city and seat of government, but also as a holy city and religious center. Powered by the engines of the decommissioned Forerunner Dreadnought, the structure was 348 kilometers in diameter and 505 kilometers in height. High Charity was protected by some of the biggest fleets in the Covenant Armada, but the station itself had weapons platforms built into its bedrock with firepower surpassing that of even the most powerful Covenant ships. The city boasted 32 super heavy plasma lances and 1900 plasma beam emitters both types of energy projectors. High Charity was then further guarded by a rapid detection network of slip space probes that could track even the smallest objects coming into close proximity of the city and mark them for obliteration. Of course, High Charity also functioned to refit and house thousands of Covenant vessels. Yes, I know ultimately High Charity was destroyed under extreme circumstances by former child abductee John 117, but the Covenant's ability to build such a structure is a huge advantage. That the Covenant's capital city, housing its most important leaders, technology, and a mass of Covenant subjects, was mobile, allowed the Covenant to avoid the Achilles heel that most species in the galaxy face, having a home world that is at the mercy of the part of space it is located in, and thus vulnerable to all sorts of changes changing conditions and threats around it. High Charity can simply move from place to place as needed. Now you might point out that High Charity required the Dreadnought's power to operate, but actually only a fraction of the Dreadnought's engine's potential output was needed to power the city, and High Charity also possessed a set of backup auxiliary reactors that were capable of generating enough power for slip space travel. Point being, the Covenant can probably build another one and don't need to innovate new technology to do so. Which is great, because they're dumb as hell.
Number one, poor health and safety regulations. So Klingons are those dark blue skinned bald aliens with Christmas tree lights on their armor. Ha <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I thought that would get you going. These are real Klingons. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, what a bunch of lovely people. But sadly, working for the Klingon Empire wasn't so lovely. Their ships were a bunch of rust buckets. But undoubtedly, one of the most dangerous places to work would have been in the mining operations on the Klingon moon of Praxis. Basically, overmining combined with poor health and safety regulations caused the entire moon to explode. Magnify. Computer enhancement. Praxis? What's left of it, sir? Many miners perished in the explosion. <laughs> and Praxis was actually vitally important for the Klingon Empire. It's Praxis, sir. It's a Klingon moon. Praxis is their key energy production facility. And thus, the destruction of Praxis did great damage to the operations of the Klingon fleet. They had to divert money from their massive military budget to dealing with the environmental damage to their homeworld, Kronos, which was in close proximity to Praxis. Put simply, they couldn't afford a war with the Federation anymore and were forced to make peace. So put simply, over-reliance on a single energy source combined with poor health and safety regulations that caused the explosion led to massive changes in the Klingon fleet's warfighting abilities. Number two, a feudal society. The Klingon Empire operated as a feudal society, which was founded by Kalos the Unforgettable, a kind of Klingon Jesus figure. His catchphrase was, today is a good day to die. So maybe not so much like Jesus. But anyway, the title of emperor became a more ceremonial and spiritual position in modern times with a chancellor leading the government in practical terms. So it was kind of like a constitutional monarchy, like Japan. Let the strength of the samurai be with you always. Well, not really, because you see, the Chancellor was the leader of the Klingon High Council, which was made up of representatives of the 24 great houses. And these great houses didn't always get along, often fighting amongst themselves. They were kind of like feudal lords operating below a king and fighting amongst each other. And sometimes they even fought against the interests of the Empire, like General Chang, a Shakespeare enthusiast. Trick us, do we not bleed? Wrong us. Shall we not revenge? Who worked against the Klingon Empire making peace with the Federation after the Praxis incident. Incoming! Or the House of Duras, whose challenge to Chancellor Gowron caused the Klingon Civil War, in which Klingon birds of prey actually attacked the Chancellor's ship. And the Chancellor was no saint either. Chancellor Gowron, in order to get General Martok, who he saw as a threat to his position to take early retirement, would send him on suicide missions in which he would either die or be disgraced in defeat. Our next target, Sarpidian Phi. Sarpidian is the headquarters of the entire 12th Order. Yes. But as you can see, Martok was very loyal to the Empire and shrugged off whatever Gowron threw at him. I will fight any battle, anywhere. Later, actions were taken to rid Gowron of his position and install Martok in his place. We'll talk about that later. Number three, too trigger happy. Klingons often shoot first without asking any questions. Like at the beginning of Star Trek The Motion Picture, where three Klingon battlecruisers encounter the space cloud known as Vajur, and before they even know what it is, they start firing torpedoes at it. Starfleet also doesn't know why they are firing torpedoes off into space. Our sensor drone is intercepting this on quad L-14. That's within Klingon boundaries. Who are they fighting? Unknown, sir. And it doesn't end well for those three vessels.
In Deep Space Nine, they launch an attack on Cardassia in a hunch that the Detapa Council have been replaced by the Founders, but they haven't, and it launches a confrontation with the Federation in which the Klingons lose a lot of ships. And eventually they find out it's actually the Klingons who'd been infiltrated by the Founders and the Cardassians do eventually ally with the Dominion, which was the very thing that they were trying to stop in the first place through their trigger-happy antics. Number four, slow technological development. While the Klingons had been more advanced than the United Earth Starfleet back in the 22nd century, it would take four Starfleet vessels to fight off just one Klingon bird of prey back then, humans quickly caught up with them, and by the 2470s, most Klingon ships still couldn't go faster than warp 9.6, while Starfleet had developed warp 9.9 capable ships such as the Intrepid class and the Sovereign class. Klingons were perhaps not really that innovative in the first place. Even their cloaking technology, which was probably their most advanced tech, was actually given to them by the Romulans. Their medical science was also underdeveloped, since most Klingon warriors would prefer to die an honorable death in battle than be revived, so they didn't really need doctors. Just kak. He said, Today is a good day to die. Number five, crude weapons. Now, it may have been because Klingons spent so much time working on hand-to-hand -hand combat with various kinds of knives that their actual ship-mounted weapons weren't anything special. Most Klingon ships used disruptors, which were the most common form of energy weapon in the galaxy used by almost everyone except the Federation. Ship-mounted disruptors were known for being weak against shields, but strong against physical matter. Could explain why the Klingons' disruptors were so effective against the Enterprise D when the Klingons had found out their shield frequency. But in general, you'd have to break through a ship's shields before you could hit the hull. Heavy disruptors also drained a lot of power from other ships' systems, and handheld disruptors didn't have a stun setting, so victims would either be killed or suffer from heavy disruptor burns. These weapons were thus viewed as as crude by the Federation and the Vulcans. Number six, weird human resources practices. We talked before about weird HR practices in the Federation, but the Klingons are even stranger. When Commander Will Riker served aboard a Klingon ship as a cultural exchange, he learned that as a first officer, in order to get a promotion, he was expected to kill his captain, and likewise, the second officer was expected to kill the first officer. Basically, serving aboard a Klingon ship would have been one of the most stressful experiences imaginable, because you'd always be looking over your shoulder to see if there was a junior officer who was trying to kill you. And it wasn't limited to just aboard ships. Even the Chancellor could be challenged to a fight to the death, and the winner would inherit the title and rule the entire empire. Hail, Worf, leader of the empire. Worf, 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 Worf. So I think this constant internal struggle would take its toll on the Klingon fleet's fighting ability. Number seven, too many smaller ships. The Klingon Bird of Prey was the classic Klingon attack ship all throughout the Next Generation era. The Klingon Empire liked these ships because they were cheap to build and they would take advantage of their guerrilla-style battle tactics. But the Bird of Prey actually had a lot of design flaws and they were easily outgunned by most Federation starships. Of course, the Klingon fleet did have other larger ships like the Vorchar class attack cruiser and this other one, which I can't pronounce. But considering that during the invasion of Cardassia and the Dominion War, you see 100 year old Katinga class battle cruisers boosting numbers in the fleet, their more modern attack cruisers were probably few and far between. Number eight, no special ops forces. The Federation had section 31. The Romulans had the Tal Shiar. If any one of you defies the Tal Shiar, you will not bear the punishment alone. Your families, all of them, will be there beside you. And the Cardassians, the Obsidian Order. I consider the entire conversation as something 
best forgotten. But the Klingon Empire didn't have any known special operations forces. Perhaps it was a matter of honor. They didn't want to skulk around in the shadows. But for a military that spends half its time cloaked, I don't think that's very likely. Number nine, their boarding parties sucked. Klingons are always getting bested in confrontations with other races. They were outgunned by Bajorans. Starfleet officers. And in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they are beaten by female Trill. Shapeshifters. Humans. And species that don't even like hand to hand combat. I find this hand to hand combat really quite distasteful. Number 10, they can't keep a secret. When the Klingons are about to attack Cardassia, they keep their intentions secret from the Federation. But Worf manages to get intelligence on the attack easily by getting one of the Klingon warriors drunk on blood wine, singing some songs, and finally he informs Worf of the glorious battle ahead. <laughs> but instead of a glorious battle, Worf notifies the Federation and they foil their plan. Perhaps the Klingons should have paid attention to this World War II propaganda poster. Number one, devotion to battle. The Klingons were a deeply spiritual people, kinda. They supposedly killed their original gods because they were more trouble than they were worth and were devoted to the legendary warrior Kalos. Kalos taught that Klingons who died an honorable death in battle would join him in Stovokor, the Klingon afterlife, where they would have 72 virgins and Wait a minute, let me just check my notes. Oh, okay, no, that's not it. They would fight an internal battle with Kalos against great enemies. On the other hand, Klingons who died a dishonorable death would descend to Grethor, which looks like this. I think the entrance speaks for itself. We don't need to see any more. Thus, all Klingons developed a determination in their heart to die an honorable death in battle and reach Stovokor, so they would never surrender, even if it meant sacrificing themselves. Perhaps today is a good day to die. Prepare for running speed! So put simply, Klingons were determined in battle. War ran through their veins and influenced every part of their life. And thus, the Klingon Imperial fleet was a formidable fighting force. Number two, starship design. In the early days, Klingons were ahead of humans in terms of technological advancement. According to Quark, Klingons had developed warp drive in Earth year 1947. That's the year that humans had only just acquired alien technology and would need another century or so and this drunkard from Montana to develop it into warp capable craft, the Phoenix. Mark! By the time of the 22nd century and the NX-01 Enterprise, Klingons had ships that could do Warp 6, whereas the Enterprise could only do Warp 5. They also possessed superior firepower. Grab hold of something. And another one. Why are they attacking us? They're not. If they wanted to destroy Enterprise, they would have done it. In the 23rd century, a Klingon D7 class battlecruiser could take on a Constitution class starship, and if a fleet of them showed up, Starfleet would have no choice but to retreat. In the 24th century, despite having to lower their military budget to deal with the Praxis incident and also make peace with the Federation, the Klingons did remain a formidable fighting force who were able to dominate against other enemies, such as the Cardassian Union, which they invaded in 2372. Commence firing on the weapon platforms. Number three, cloaking devices. Klingons supposedly obtained cloaking technology from the Romulans, not strictly canon, but whatever, and cloaking devices quickly became standard on most Klingon vessels. This gave the Klingons an advantage over non-cloak capable species. Check off. 
I've lost the bird of prey. She must have cloaked. Raise shields. The Klingons even developed a method of firing weapons while cloaked, which was used by General Chang's ship before it was destroyed by the Enterprise. <laughs> The Federation would later sign the Treaty of Algeron with the Romulan Star Empire, which forbade them from using ship-mounted cloaking technology, so the Klingons would retain this advantage into the 24th century. What do you know about the Treaty of Algeron? 2311, it redefined the Romulan neutral zone. It also outlawed the use of cloaking technology on Starfleet vessels. Number 4. The Ability to Punch Above Their Weight the Klingon fleet relied heavily on the Bird of Prey, which were cheap to build and were mostly small models compared to the average Federation starship, but they were often able to punch above their weight, especially when dealing with Federation vessels that weren't 100% battle ready. In Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, a single bird of prey is able to recover from an attack by the Enterprise and fire on the ship, crippling vital systems, forcing the crew to abandon ship and self-destruct. In Star Trek Generations, a single bird of prey destroys the Enterprise D after getting inside info on their shield systems. They have found a way to penetrate our shields. Now that bird of prey was destroyed by the Enterprise just before she went down, but hey, remember what Kayla said, today is a good day to die. Number 5. Cavalry Style Battle Tactics The Klingons often employed cavalry style battle tactics where they would send ships in on raids behind enemy lines. The tactic is to first send a couple of craft to carry out an initial attack, then retreat. Once the enemy thinks the attack is over and brings out crews to repair the damage, the Klingons begin the real attack with a larger number of ships. General Martok used this tactic when attacking a Dominion base on Trelka 5, but the tactic dates back to the time of Kor, a Klingon warrior from the original series who used the tactic when attacking a Federation colony on Caleb 4. On a side note, this is what Klingons looked like in the original series with a limited makeup budget. Look, that's Kor there. Now I know, they did try to explain this lack of cranial ridges as the results of a vaccine for a virus uh, in Enterprise. My Targ won't even recognize me. In the future it may be possible to reverse the uh, cosmetic effect. I suppose this is what I deserve. Millions of my people will have to live with this disfigurement. It'll be passed on to our children. But the real reason was just lack of makeup budget. Interestingly, Kor was actually played by the same actor, John Kolokos, in both the original series and in Deep Space Nine when he was in his late 60s. He passed away when he was 71. Number 6. An Imperial Force Ah, there's nothing quite like the glory of a massive empire subjugating other civilizations under one rule. Oh, the Klingons, yes. So the Klingon Imperial Fleet served the Klingon Empire, which for much of its history was an expansionist power who conquered and subjugated other species, using up their planet's resources. In the original series episode Errand of Mercy, our old friend Kor invades Organia and installs himself as military governor. I am Kor, military governor of Organia. Who are you? The Creosians were another species that were subjugated to Klingon rule. They were one of those types of aliens whose looks were dictated by the lack of a makeup budget. Just paint some spots on them and away we go. Anyway, the fact that the Klingon Empire was willing to go and directly get involved, liberating other species from whatever regime they were subject to and making them citizens of the Klingon Empire just inspired greatness. The Federation, on the other hand, didn't inspire greatness in anyone. I know. It's so bubbly and cloying and happy. Just like the Federation. But you know what's really frightening? If you drink enough of it, you begin to like it. It's insidious. Just like the Federation. Number seven, their bases were well protected. Now in our 10 Floors of Starfleet series, we often talked about how the Earth was left defenseless when attacked by Borg cubes. That wasn't so with the Klingons. They kept their bases well protected. According to Starfleet Intelligence, Chancellor Gowron has relocated Klingon military headquarters to Tigercore. 
That will make our job more difficult. Tiger Corps is located in an asteroid field deep in Klingon space. It is probably the most heavily fortified installation in the Empire. The Tachyon detection grid would scan for cloaked ships trying to enter the base, and the 30 vessels in orbit would see off any intruders trying to attack. Klingons also installed orbital defense systems around planets that were under their control. Basically, you knew you were safe when you were being ruled by the Klingon Empire. Number 8. They did martial arts. Now, if you've seen Star Trek The Next Generation, you'll have seen Worf's Tai Chi. I mean, technically, it's a Klingon martial art called Mokbara, but actually, it's just Tai Chi with a few moves slightly changed. But anyway, Klingons were pretty good at martial arts. Their rite of ascension ceremony looked like something out of 36 chambers of Shaolin. I travel the river of blood. Yeah, they were tough, and they had many stories of glorious battles, such as this one. The Battle of Kluck de Kel Bracht is a legendary Klingon victory over the Romulans almost a century ago. This was the battle that the Klingons won against the Romulans using melee weapons, such as Batliths. Look, this is a Batlith. Ah. I don't know why they didn't just use disruptors. I mean, both species would have had advanced technology at that time. It was only a hundred years before the DS9 era. But some things in Star Trek are just a mystery, like why Kirk fought Gorn in slow motion. But anyway, the Klingons were good at fighting, except when the plot of an episode required them to suck, basically any time they fought against Starfleet. Number 9. Luck was on their side. The Klingons weren't that good at advancing technology, but they did sometimes accidentally or by fate stumble across fortune-changing advancements, like the time they developed this defense for a Breen energy weapon that disabled every single ship except for one at the Battle of Chintaka. 311 ships, Federation, Romulan, and Klingon, all lost power. But one didn't. A bird of prey called the Katang. Why? What was different about the Katang? We're not really sure. The only thing we can figure is that just prior to the engagement, their chief engineer adjusted the tritium intermix to compensate for a containment problem in the warp core. I've ordered every ship in the Klingon fleet to adjust its reactor the same way. Maybe it was the guiding hand of Kalos reaching out from Stovo Core. Number 10. Robust interrogation techniques. Klingons were into robust interrogation techniques, like waterboarding. Well, here we go. This guy's like a shadow. Came into the season, got his first finals last time out in Detroit. Now he's coming out here. Nah, even more terrifying than waterboarding. I'll let Kor explain. Would you like to try our little truth finder? I don't understand it. It's a mind sifter or mind ripper, depending on how much force is used. We can record every thought, every bit of knowledge in a man's mind. Of course, when that much force is used, the mind is emptied. Permanently, I'm afraid. What's left is more vegetable than human. Would you like to be on the receiving end of that? I certainly wouldn't. Only problem was it didn't work on Vulcans. It should not be underestimated, Captain. It reaches directly into the mind. We Vulcans have certain mental certain disciplines which enable me to maintain a shield. Without those disciplines, there would be no protection. 